Buen dia, good morning everyone, and thank you for attending today's hearing of the New York City Council Transportation Committee. My name is Idanis Rodriguez and I chair this committee. We are joined by my colleague, Council Member Ku Levine and Lander. As most New Yorkers can tell you, our street look like parking lots given the slowing pace of traffic. Over the past five years, vehicles have moved about 10% slower through the central business district, hindering the movement of goods, service, and people. The impact of this can be se severe. A study by the Partnership for New York City, which is now nearly 10 years old, found that the regional cause of congestion are 13 billion in low economy output and 52,000 jobs per year. This cost has likely grown in the past decade as our economy has expanded and traffic has become a nightmare. On top of this, more cars on our roads mean more dangerous conditions for cyclists, pedestrians, and other users. We are working hard to achieve Vision Zero and we have great partner from Mayor de Blasio, Chief Chan, Commissioner Paul Tromber, and TLC Commissioner, and many great friends. And investing hundreds of millions of dollars to save lives, and it is counterproductive to have a trend toward driving over other modes. And lastly, this congestion adds considerably to our carbon output and hurt our environment. While some in Washington may not think it wise to commit to saving our planet, New York cert certainly does, and we will. We hurt this effort when we allow congestion to build up with millions of idling cars. The increase in congestion has been caused by se 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 several factors, some positive, others not so much. Thankfully, we have had a healthy growing economy and an uptick in construction, both of which add to congestion. This has corresponded with increase in job growth and drops in unemployment, positive trends for our city. We have also seen population growth and more tourists than ever coming to New York City, adding to our status as a global one and attracting the talent of tomorrow. This means more people on our streets and sidewalks and more people supporting local businesses and paying taxes. However, the factors that are less positive stem from an inefficient movement of people and goods are in a lack of enforcement of existing laws. A recent study by former DOT Traffic Commissioner Bruce Schabler shows that the, that the rapid increase in for hire vehicle trips has added considerably to congestion on our streets. With 500,000 trips per day, adding 600 million more miles driving on our streets. While it is good to see innovation in technology improving access to services New Yorkers value, the massive uptick means people are choosing not to leave their personal cars at home, but to leave public transit, walking in other malls, malls and take cabs instead. In New York, we have an over reliance on trucks to move goods. With an increase in online shopping, what many have called the Amazon effect, more packages are being delivered to more people than ever before. Trucks often make deliveries during the day, even during rush hour. Without better curbside management, these trucks are often left to double park when they make deliveries, clogging a full lane of traffic and backing up a street for blocks. Finally, the prevalence of double parkers, P 
people parking illegally in bike and bus lanes and the misuse of parking placards is probably our lowest, lowest hanging fruit when it comes to fighting congestion. According to Dr. Bob Pasol, professor for the civil engineer at City College, who, will be, who we will hear from today, just by, by enforcing our existing traffic laws, we can cut subject congestion in Manhattan by close to 15%. Through these and other means, which we hope to address today in full, we can reduce congestion and make our streets healthier and safer for all users. Yet, ultimately, one thing remains very clear. Manhattan and our central business district is not place for personal and luxury vehicles. This is the densest island on the planet where with millions of pedestrians and cyclists moving about, with buses carrying thousands and where commercial and municipal vehicles keep the city clean, moving and producing, producing. One way to start is through legislation introduced by Council Member Mark Levine and myself intro 1031, which will require the DOT to study the impact of traffic of trucks making deliveries at night instead of during the day. DOT encouraged this through a pilot program in recent years and participating businesses found positive results, both in logistically efficiency and through cost saving. This is a stringent approach that we should look at more seriously for wider implementation. Just over a month ago, in the lead up to our car free day in April, I proposed several ideas for reducing congestion through rethinking how the labor of large goods are made. In cities around the world, including here in the United States, in Portland, Oregon, large-scale deliveries are broken up and delivered by electric tri tricycles. They take off less space, are less likely to hit or injure pedestrians or other cyclists, and do not dominate curbside and club lanes in Double Park. This means changing state laws to allow of electronic cyclists but it is something that could have a positive impact on our streets. I'm calling on Albany, the governor and the state legislator to work with the city to make those changes happening now. In our most congested areas, we have a responsibility as a city not to contribute directly to this issue. This means reducing the use of city vehicles in the Manhattan core unless absolutely necessary. And I hope to see all the city agency getting those workers to use the train and the buses unless they have to use city vehicles to do inspection or other uh, job related to the city. There need to be restrictions on placard use in the Midtown and downtown areas so that these vehicles are not even considered when employees need to travel to these areas. I'm hopeful, I am hopeful we will hear from DOT some strategies in the mayor's forthcoming congestion plan, including some ideas about curbside management, parking pricing models that make driving less incentivized, especially in Manhattan's core. From NYPD, I'm hopeful and hopefully, hopefully we will hear more about the enforcement plans for illegal placard use, including any early results, how we can better address double parking, and how we are responding to trucks running off designated truck routes. And from TLC, and hopefully we can hear about industry trends and how we might better consider the number of for higher cars oper operating on our roads, particularly in Midtown, Western Queens, and Northwestern Brooklyn. 
from our other panelists and interested in hearing solutions to these congestion challenge, challenges we face and how we can discuss driving into Manhattan. And hopefully, hopefully we can hear about how many drivers in New York City on a given day are actually city residents and how many are just passing through. Lastly, the challenge we face in that many New Yorkers feel comfortable that they will get to their destination faster, cheaper, and safer in car than in other ways. This means we must make other forms of transportation better options when it comes to affordability, safety, and most of all, speed. This is a major challenge, but I know there are very good ideas out there, and it is incumbent upon us as leaders in the city to put them into action. In the last couple of hours, we hear a plan for Plan of New York. We will need to get some briefing from that proposal, but we need to discuss any proposal that came to in front of us. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our committee staff for putting this hearing together today. Council Faisal Malik, Policy Analyst Jonathan Maserano, Gafar Salov, and Emily Rooney, and my staff Jose Luis, Russell Murphy, and Stephanie Miliano. Welcome back, Russell. Uh, and I would like now to give my colleague, Council Member Levine, an opportunity to speak on our bill, a uh, colleague by both Hen and I, Intro 1031. And before that, I would like to recognize Council Member Chin, Richard, Van Bremer, Ross, and Menchaca. Well, thank you, Chair Rodriguez, for con convening this hearing. And thank you for that incredibly comprehensive uh, and co <clears throat> cogent and I think powerful summation of this challenge and what we need to do to meet it. I'm just going to briefly add my voice to those acknowledging that congestion is at crisis levels in the city. It's a mounting crisis, especially in the lower half of Manhattan and nearby parts of Brooklyn. This is a threat to our economy. It is a threat to our environment. It is a safety threat. Uh, for motorists and vulnerable pedestrians and bicyclists. And frankly, for drivers, it's driving them crazy to be stuck in traffic uh, longer and longer and longer periods. This is not good for anybody. Um, we need to attack this crisis on many, many fronts. Um, I happen to be a supporter together with the chair of the Move New York plan uh, to bring about fairness and the cost that people pay uh, to get into Manhattan, whether it's by mass transit or by a bridge or a tunnel. Um, I understand we're going to be hearing today from Move New York about um, new developments and uh, what they believe are the legal options of the city to move that agenda forward. Um, clearly, we have to engage in the ongoing effort of enforcing traffic rules for everybody. Um, we have to make sure that the ongoing degradation in the subway system is reversed so that we um, can once again begin adding to the people who are riding the subways, not seeing a reduction as we did in the past year. And there's no doubt that the strange phenomena of stores taking their deliveries during the busy busiest hours of the days needs to be examined. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than seeing an 18-wheeler backing up, uh, making a delivery to a store on a busy street at the busiest time of day. Um, I think that the rise in the number of chains in Manhattan has contributed to this phenomena and the almost previously unknown presence of big box stores in these focus areas is part of the problem. And, and I think that those two um, parts of the retail landscape need to get the closest scrutiny. Um, this is complicated. It affects neighborhoods uh, who will be impa impacted by off-hour deliveries. I think the impact on mom and pop stores who don't have the staff necessarily to handle deliveries at off hours needs to be considered. But it is definitely time to look hard at this. And so I'm pleased to be uh, sponsoring intro, intro 1031 together with the chair and many of our colleagues um, that would examine this issue in a sober and urgent way as warranted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now we have the lawyers to do the affirmation for the administration. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation, and with me here today is Eric Beaton, our Acting Deputy Commissioner for Transportation Planning and Management. I'm also pleased to be joined by Transportation Chief Thomas Chan, who will be speaking about NYPD's enforcement efforts. Thank you for inviting us to testify today on behalf of Mayor de Blasio about congestion on our streets and the steps our agencies are taking to address this challenging and multidimensional issue. As you alluded, Mr. Chairman, New York City is currently experiencing a period of remarkable growth that is straining our transportation system as never before. Between 2010 and 2016, the city's population rose to over 8.5 million, an increase of more than 360,000 new residents. The number of jobs in the city has swelled to 4.3 million, up 500,000 since the pre-recession peak of 2008. Tourism is booming. Nearly 61 million people visited the city in 2016, up 68 percent just since 2000. And as we all know, development is everywhere. In recent years, the city has added tens of thousands of new housing units and millions of square feet of new office space. Up until now, New York City's largely been able to meet the travel demand generated by this growth with existing subway capacity and increased walking and biking. Between 2010 and 2016, citywide subway ridership increased 22 percent to 1.76 billion. Ridership is now 78 percent higher than during the system's nadir of 991 million riders back in 1982. The number of frequent bike riders has risen 54 percent to 778,000 in the last five years, and pedestrian activity has increased dramatically. To support these shifts, the city has significantly expanded bus, bike, and pedestrian facilities, and has done so in most cases without reducing overall vehicle throughput. But there is fierce competition for curb and street space. Growth in population and economic activity has led to an increase in truck deliveries and associated double parking. As the city attracts more visitors, workers, and residents, sidewalks and crosswalks are busier than ever. With more construction has come an increase in lane closures impacting traffic flow. The rapid growth of the for hire vehicle industry has also raised questions about their role in contributing to congestion, particularly in the Manhattan core. The app-based dispatch sector has continued to rise dramatically, with active vehicles growing from around 20,000 in June of 2015 to nearly 55,000 by March of 2017. And trip volumes growing from around 100,000 trips per day in June 2015 to over 400,000 trips per day in March of 2017, according to the most recent TLC data. Starting in June of this year, the TLC will begin collecting more complete date, trip data from the four higher vehicles, including both trip duration and destination, in addition to pickup location. This additional data will enable the city to better understand where and when FHVs are operating and how they may be impacting traffic flow. This improved data stream will be used to inform future policy responses. But overall, DOT believes that the city's extraordinary growth is likely the dominant factor leading to congestion and dropping traffic speeds on the streets in Midtown and in major commercial streets across the five boroughs. In Manhattan, south of 60th Street, for example, yellow taxi GPS data show that the average weekday speeds dropped from 9.5 miles per hour in 2010 down to 8.0 miles per hour in 2016. And of course, I don't need to tell this committee that traffic congestion is a significant issue in the outer boroughs as well, especially at the approaches to major river crossings and highways and in hubs like downtown Brooklyn, downtown Flushing, Long Island City. And the sheer size of our city, more than 300 square miles of densely built urban area spread across three separate major islands and a portion of the mainland means that some New Yorkers face particularly long commutes. Well, on the one hand, increased congestion is a sign of a thriving economy. We hear loud and clear from community boards, elected officials, businesses, and New Yorkers who drive, are stuck on the bus, or use crowded sidewalks that they're frustrated by congestion and are asking the city for answers. As we consider strategies, the city is thinking about roadway congestion as one dimension of a larger challenge. New York City's overall transportation system, including our streets and subways, is nearing the limit of its capacity given the current way we manage and operate our streets and enforce their use. So our response to vehicular congestion must be part of a larger integrated strategy to make our entire transportation system more efficient. Rather than framing the problem only around average travel speeds or vehicle throughput, DOT is focused on improving street efficiency, by which I mean the number of people and the quantity of goods that a street can process in a typical day. An efficient street balances the need of all users while giving priority to the most space-efficient modes, like bus, transit, walking, and biking. 
This also means managing our curbs to facilitate deliveries, which cannot be shifted to other modes while eliminating double parking. Efficient streets also provide travel choices to residents, support Vision Zero, advance the city's 80 by 50 greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, and support economy and tourism. Today I'm going to speak about the range of measures that DOT and its partner agencies are considering for New York City to improve street efficiency. But before I turn to that discussion, I want to briefly address one argument that invariably comes up whenever the problem of traffic congestion is raised. Some New Yorkers see the changes DOT has made to our streets, like more bike lanes and bus lanes and increased space for pedestrians, and assume that those changes are solely responsible for the increase in congestion that we're experiencing. I want to be clear on this point. Given the city's dramatic population growth, our streets would be experiencing rising congestion even if we'd not added a single bike, bus lane, or pedestrian plaza. In fact, without the growth in transit, biking, and walking that these improvements have supported, congestion would likely be worse, and the city would be deprived of the significant safety, environmental, and mobility benefits that these street efficiency investments provide. Other global cities like New York City that are experiencing record growth while facing finite street capacity, including London, Los Angeles, Paris, and Stockholm, are deploying two major responses to reduce congestion and keep people and goods moving. The first is road pricing, and the second is major investment in transit expansion. Although pricing has proved to be an effective tool to reduce traffic congestion, it is also controversial. Several pricing plans have been put forward over the years for New York City, but none has thus far gained traction in Albany. On the other hand, major transit investment seeks to shift car trips from car or taxi to mass transit by providing a fast, reliable, and convenient alternative. In dense urban centers, this typically means large-scale investment in rail and subway networks on grade-separated rights-of-way. When we look at peer cities across the globe, we see what kind of major transit expansion is possible. London is planning $59 billion in transit investments through 2021, including 31 new miles of rail, 26 miles of which will be built in tunnels under the heart of the city. Paris is investing $25 billion in its metro to create four new lines with 68 stations and more than 120 miles of track. And the voters of Los Angeles recently approved a sales tax increase, which will fund $44 billion in transit projects over 40 years, including 45 miles of new rail by 2031. Overall, U.S. cities and states passed 55 ballots in 2016 to provide tens of billions in funding for new transit investment. Closer to home, the MTA recently completed the first phase of Second Avenue subway, which now serves over 176,000 riders daily and has reduced passenger volumes on the overcrowded Lexington Avenue line. Since service began, traffic volumes have decreased on the Lexington Avenue and Second Avenues, and taxi speeds are up 7%. Taxi trips on the quarter have decreased by 32%, compared to a citywide decrease of only 11% during the same period. But despite its $4.5 billion price tag, the Second Avenue subway is less than two miles long, includes only three new stations, and took decades to complete. Although the MTA is planning over $32 billion in capital spending through 2019 for the region, most of that money will go towards maintaining the MTA's aging system to keep it in a state of good repair. While the MTA absolutely must maintain the subway system, and we've seen recently what happens when this trillion-dollar asset is not adequately cared for, we must also be able to expand the system at the same time. Looking forward, the city and region are unlikely to see the level and pace of transit investment necessary to meet growing travel demand and make a meaningful dent in congestion. Were the MTA positioned to truly meet that need, the agency would be completing major projects like the Second Avenue subway every few years. As it stands, full funding for the next phase of the project, a two-mile extension from 96th Street to 125th Street, has yet to be identified and construction is years away. Without these two tools, pricing and major subway system expansion, the city is nonetheless looking at a whole range of tools that we do have at our disposal to tackle congestion. I'm going to talk about these approaches largely in the context of the Manhattan core, but the, these ideas could also be tailored to other congested corridors across the five boroughs. As these strategies move forward, we'll continue to have in-depth discussions and collaboration with our colleagues at NYPD, the Department of Finance, Taxi and Limousine Commission, to identify strategies regarding enforcement, curbside parking, placards, freight deliveries, technology, and traffic rules and penalties. Chief Chan will speak about the NYPD's overall enforcement efforts, including the NYPD's newly expanded Midtown Traffic Enforcement Tax Force. In addition to these initiatives, DOT and NYPD are considering curb regulation and street design changes to improve traffic flow during the most congested times. 
One option under consideration is to expand upon existing parking regulations on key cross down streets by restricting deliveries to one side of the street. Several streets in East Midtown have these restrictions in place today. An expansion of this approach could increase rush hour capacity, but would require a significant expansion of NYPD personnel to effectively enforce. DOT is also developing a citywide parking blueprint, a data-driven and context-sensitive plan to better manage the curb in commercial districts across the five boroughs. In areas such as downtown Flushing, downtown Brooklyn, and Long Island City, the agency will explore new strategies for efficiently managing parking, including progressive meter rates, extended meter hours, and integration of delivery zones with passenger parking. But even the best conceived parking rules and rates can do little to address congestion unless they're effectively enforced and carry meaningful penalties for violations. This too would require major new resources for the NYPD, particularly for personnel. And many of our parking rules have not been updated in decades. In collaboration with NYPD and the Department of Finance, we're working to identify ways to make our rules easier to understand and enforce and advocate for increased penalties for congestion causing and safety related violations, especially in traffic hotspots. DOT Commissioner, I probably hear more complaints about improper use of placards than almost anyone else in city government, so I'm glad that Mayor de Blasio recently announced several steps that we're taking to immediately combat placard abuse. The city needs a parking placard system to ensure that law enforcement, city agencies, and our court systems can function effectively, but we know there are real impacts to placard abuse. These include increased congestion in blocked bus lanes, reduced curb access for customers and deliveries for businesses, safety issues when bike lanes are obstructed or fire hydrants are blocked, millions of dollars in lost parking revenue, and public frustration with a system that appears unfair and rife with abuse. DOT is responsible for issuing parking placards to city agencies and public officials, nonprofits, to clergy and the disability community. Our authorized parking team, which includes an enforcement unit, is working hard to improve all aspects of our system, including making placards harder to forge and training NYPD personnel on identifying fraudulent placards. We're also looking at parking enforcement best practices from around the world, such as using advanced license plate readers capable of quickly spanning, scanning all the vehicles on a block and then automatically issuing violations. This will make the enforcement process much more efficient and fraud proof. Likewise, in the longer term, DOT and the NYPD are exploring the transition from paper placards to a more secure electronic placard system. As part of our parking blueprint, DOT is also analyzing the parking needs and challenges in commercial districts and neighborhoods throughout the city. We hope to use that information to come up with more comprehensive solutions in areas around courthouses, for example, where parking is both critical for government functions but also very scarce. We hope to ultimately create a more rational parking system in those areas which, combined with strong enforcement by the NYPD, will create a culture of compliance amongst placard holders citywide. New York City relies on trucks to bring in over 90% of its good. As our street grid lacks alleys, many deliveries happen at the curb and often during busy times, as Councilmember Levine has mentioned. Truck deliveries are essential to our economy, but as recognized by the Councilmember and Chairman Rodriguez with Intro 1031, they contribute to double parking, noise, and air pollution, as well as congestion. One way to try and improve street efficiency is to shift truck trips to less busy hours in the evening and overnight. In 2013, DOT worked with 400 businesses to encourage them to shift to off-hour deliveries through a federally funded incentive program. Based on the success of that program, DOT is launching a new off-hour delivery management program, this time with a participation goal of 900 additional businesses. We welcome council members joining us in the outreach for this effort. In Manhattan, DOT's Midtown in Motion system uses a network of sensors to monitor real-time traffic conditions. The system alerts operators at DOT's Traffic Management Center, who then implement pre-programmed signal timing changes to clear the bottleneck. DOT plans to expand this system from 23rd Street down to the Battery and also to implement it in downtown Flushing. DOT also makes use of a, of a variety of data to understand transportation conditions and congestion, deriving information from taxi GPS units, from EasyPass, and from Bluetooth devices. We're also exploring opportunities to use image analytics from mobile cameras to monitor double parking and curb use, as well as to improve traffic safety. I'm also happy to say that to supplement TLC data and information from DOT's own traffic monitoring equipment, DOT will be purchasing data collected from GPS and cars and phones from a commercial vendor. This more fine-grained data source will provide vehicle speeds, origins, and destinations citywide, giving us a complete picture of traffic flow and congestion 
not just in Midtown, but across the five boroughs, and will allow us to quantify the congestion reduction potential of different initiatives and measure their success. Building out on our transit system, we're also going to continue our work on improving bus service. DOT will continue its partnership with New York City Transit to expand select bus service and address the delay and reliability problems on local and express bus routes. We applaud New York City Transit for their just released proposal to overhaul express bus service on Staten Island, and we look forward to working with them on it. DOT and New York City Transit are installing real-time bus information displays to improve the customer experience, expanding the use of bus lanes and queue jumps so buses can avoid traffic bottlenecks, and implementing transit signal priority so buses spend more time moving and less time stuck at red lights. And I'm happy to announce that DOT is planning to upgrade the curbside bus lane along Fifth Avenue from 34th Street to 61st Street to a more effective double lane. Fifth Avenue is the second busy bus corridor in the city, serving a remarkable 115,000 riders daily, including over 43,000 express bus riders. Those express bus riders include about 4,000 riders in Councilmember Vaca's district that take the BXM7 and the BXM8. Outside the Manhattan core, DOT and New York City Transit are also working to launch SBS service on two more routes in 2017, building on our 13 existing routes, Woodhaven Boulevard in Queens and 161st Street in the Bronx. By the end of 2016, SBS routes will carry over 380,000 daily riders, or more than 15% of New York City's 2.5 million average weekday ridership, with speed improvements on pre-SBS performance of 10 to 30%. Beyond bus service, the city is continuing with its own new rapid transit project, the BQX. Working with our partners at EDC, we continue to plan for the route which will run along the Brooklyn-Queens waterfront. And through our citywide transit study, we'll identify other opportunities for transit expansion. DOT is also focused on expanding biking and other alternatives to driving. We're continuing to make investments in our now 1,125 mile bike network so it reaches more parts of the city and better connects key nodes. At the same time, DOT is working with its partner Motivate to add about 2,000 more bikes to our bike share network this year and expanding city bike service to new neighborhoods in three boroughs. We're also investing in the Staten Island Ferry where ridership is growing and we're working with EDC on the very successful rollout of the citywide ferry service. As you know, on May 1st, New York City relaunched ferry service to East 34th Street, Hunters Point South, Greenpoint, North Williamsburg, South Williamsburg, Dumbo and Wall Street with a new operator, new boats, and a new, more affordable price. At the same time, we've also launched new service from Wall Street to the Rockaways with a stop in Sunset Park. Just last Thursday, the South Brooklyn route launched, connecting Wall Street, Dumbo, Pier 6, and Brooklyn Bridge Park, Red Hook, Sunset Park, and a new stop in Bay Ridge. Summer service to Governor's Island will also depart from Wall Street, Dumbo, Pier 6, and Red Hook. This August, ferries will begin serving Hallett's Point in Astoria with stops in Long Island City, East 34th Street, and Wall Street. And in spring 2018, we'll be adding service to the Lower East Side and Soundview. And we're thinking creatively about how to reduce car ownership, parking pressure, and overall traffic volumes by facilitating more convenient access to car sharing. This year, we'll launch a pilot program that will create designated on-street parking spots for car sharing vehicles, as well as reserve spaces in our city-owned lots and garages. As you know, this pilot program was codified by council legislation, and we've been happy to have many positive conversations in recent weeks and months with individual council members about how they think the program might work in their districts. In closing, I wanna reiterate the congestion on our streets should be understood within the larger context of the economy of the city and the region. New York is a global capital and a leader in finance, culture, creativity, and innovation. The gross domestic product of New York City region is $1.4 trillion a year, equivalent to the entire economy of South Korea. Each day, almost a million people commute into New York City from the region, approximately 1.4 million enter Manhattan below 60th Street, and over a million tons of freight travel into, out of, or through the city. This incredible density and scale of economic activity makes some level of congestion in New York City inevitable, and congestion is a sign of a thriving economy. But we know the larger challenge we face is how New York can continue to grow our economy, increase the number of middle class jobs, and attract people from all over the country and the world to live, work, or visit while ensuring the safety and mobility of the traveling public. This task is bigger than any one agency and requires the city to work together with our partners at the MTA, the Port Authority, in state and local government, as well as business against civic organizations, our enforcement agencies, to keep people and goods moving efficiently. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and I look forward to your questions.
I, before we hear from Chief Shamai, also to recognize that we also have here Councilmember Miller and Councilmember Dangaran. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Council. I am Chief Thomas Chan, the Chief of the Transportation Bureau of the New York City Police Department. In addition to the Department of Transportation Commissioner Polly Trottenberg, I am joined here today by my NYPD colleagues, Inspector Dennis Fulton and Oleg Chernovsky, the Director of Legislative Affairs. On behalf of the Police Commissioner, James P. O'Neill, I wish to thank the City Council for the opportunity to speak to you today about how the city can more effectively address traffic congestion. At the outset of my testimony today, I believe it's important for me to state that the police department recognizes that traffic congestion can have an inverse, adverse impact on the quality of life, environment, and public health of those living and operating within the city and the region. Facilitating the efficient movement of people in our city, especially in the backdrop of growing populace, requiring the action of multiple stakeholders. This includes the police department as well as our fellow city agencies, our state and federal partners. Given the magnitude of this topic and the myriad of issues associated with it, I believe it's essential that I discuss some of the major initiatives that the department has undertaken and will undertake to mitigate traffic congestion. Part of Transportation Bureau's responsibility is to design, develop, and implement strategies to improve traffic flow, remove obstacles impeding traffic flow, and to expedite the passage of vehicles and bicycles within the city. Parking summons enforcement is not performed only for its own sake, but to enhance the safety and to improve the flow of traffic. In fact, the Traffic Enforcement District, which is under my command, expresses its purpose and its goal with the phrase, quote, move traffic, reduce collisions, move traffic, protect pedestrians, move traffic, save lives, move traffic, move traffic, move traffic. We take this idea seriously and remind all our members of the Traffic Enforcement District of their mission daily. As of May 25th, the Traffic Enforcement agents have issued over 3.2 million parking summonses. Parking summonses enforcement has increased approximately 3% from last year. Personnel under my command respond to both planned and unplanned traffic conditions and work with outside agencies regarding these issues. For the example, the department's traffic operations district regularly conducts traffic enforcement of yellow taxi cabs and black car liveries. It conducts joint operations with the Taxi Limousine Commission to target illegal street hails, which can slow traffic and also performs parking enforcement at taxi stands against unauthorized parking violators. Additionally, the Traffic Operations District assigns sergeants in Manhattan to monitor construction sites and identifies conditions that are causing congestion. Their duty is to maintain a close working relationship with the Department of Transportation and the Department of Buildings to alleviate the congestion problems. When encountering construction sites that are operating outside their scope of, or conditions, the construction sergeant will notify the department's construction compliance unit to respond to these locations and to issue violations. This unit conducts highly specialized enforcement, issues summonses to companies that break road surfaces or otherwise take out lanes or use without having the proper permits to do so. Where more serious issues are presented, they will notify the Department of Transportation's Highway Inspection Quality Assurance Unit. The department has also taken a targeted approach to bus enforcement, specifically regarding parking enforcement against vehicles that are not buses but are utilizing bus layover areas. Enforcement also involves identifying violations pertaining to bus lanes, both moving and parking summonses and bus stops. The department's citywide traffic task force provides traffic control at focused intersections along main traffic routes and maintains a high visibility enforcement patrol in the vicinity of major transportation hubs such as Penn Station, Grand Central Station, and Port Authority Bus Terminal. Specifically, 
The task force focuses on traffic flow violations such as double parking, illegal U-turns, disobeying traffic control signals. The task force is deployed to major emergency incidents that are, take place in our city, such as large-scale fires, in order to isolate the incident by diverting tra uh, vehicles, pedestrians from the area while expediting the response of emergency personnel and equipment. Moreover, last year, our Traffic Enforcement District created a separate traffic task force to combat congestion and to move traffic in Midtown Manhattan. This highly mobile unit issues parking summonses, directs traffic, patrols their post in department smart cars. It has also identified two particular problems in Midtown that slows traffic down. Unauthorized layovers by buses and abuse of hotel loading zones. As a result, our traffic enforcement personnel has steadily focused on these issues. The task force is a valuable resource and we will be expanding it. It is also important to acknowledge that the work of our auxiliary officers performing regarding traffic management. Our auxiliary units are assigned to control the flow of pedestrians at major city events such as parades, demonstrations, and holiday celebrations. They are also tasked with responding to large-scale unplanned incidents to control vehicular and pedestrian access to affected areas, and they are volunteers. Last year, as part of the Vision Zero initiative, the department coordinated a citywide traffic initiative focused on averting hazardous parking and moving infractions that interfere with the safe passage of our cyclists, known as Operation Safe Passage. This effort was initiated to provide safe passage to our cyclists and reduce bicycle-involved injuries. During the summer and the fall of 2016, the department conducted four of these citywide safety initiatives, bicycle safety initiatives, which resulted in the issuance of a total of 530,000 hazardous parking summonses and more than 7,000 summonses for parking in the bike lane. Recently, the administration announced new plans to enforce against parking placard fraud and abuse. The department is committed to reducing the improper and fraudulent use of parking placards. When motorists believe that they can park anywhere without consequences, they can often obstruct bike lanes, bus stops, crosswalks, and other spaces that create hazardous conditions for all New Yorkers. Under this new plan, the department will create a dedicated unit that reports to the chief of department that will consist of 16 dedicated enforcement personnel in the Transportation Bureau Citywide Task Force. They will identify counterfeit placards and misuse at hotspots in every borough. The department also intends to hire an additional 100 traffic agents for deployment citywide and to add additional towing capacity to towing vehicles that are using placards fraudulently and illegally. This new initiative will help ensure our city streets are kept clear and that the privileges are not abused. Before concluding, I'd like to commend the Council for highlighting this important topic. We look forward to maintaining an open dialogue on how the city can more effectively address traffic congestion. There is no one-size-fits-all approach to this subject, and the Police Department is con committed to working in collaboration with all our city partners, including the Council, to address this issue. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I'm pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Do I need to answer questions? Nobody else to testify? Okay. Uh, so I have many questions, but I'm gonna be asking a few, since my colleagues also, they have questions to ask. Uh, when you look at doing the weeks they which is the like the weekdays and the time that you can say that congestion is worse in New York City? In this case, particular in Midtown. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the I mean the standard morning congestion period is around seven to ten, but I, I think we all have to acknowledge that it is pretty congested in Midtown, you know, most of the day. You know, you certainly see a, a spike in the morning and again in the evening, but it's, it's in a state of heavy congestion 
pretty much most of the day until, until you get into the pretty late evening hours. Is that something that the NYPD? Look for it. And before asking the next question, I'd like to thank you know the administration that through both of you, Chief Shannon and DOT Commissioner Polly Tromber, you came with solutions, and I think that that's what we need. I think it's for the interest of the public and private sector to say we cannot live with the level of congestion that is hurting our city. So I'm happy to see that you know there's good solutions for the problems that we have. It, can we agree that? A more efficient mass transportation system can also help to reduce congestion since more New Yorkers will be switching for car ownership to buses, ferry, train. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as I, I said in my testimony, the, the really impressive example of that is, you know, the, the MTA, as you know, at the beginning of the year, opened up three new subway stops on the Upper East Side, and we're already looking at data and seeing more people riding the subway, fear, fewer people taking cabs, and a reduction in congestion. And you know, it was a pretty, so nice it was a two mile addition to the system, but I think we can all extrapolate that if the city could build out more rapidly more underground subway lines, we would really, I think, see a big dramatic improvement in people being able to get out of cars and taxis and, and use the mass transit. But can, can we agree that, you know, we don't have it, whatever, $10 billion in to build a second avenue and another type of second avenue subway in the next 10 years, but we have buses in our city and someone who live in Queens that they had to take to pay three fare, two fare, because they had to switch from one bus to the other and they had to take a train. And definitely this is something that I hope that the city keep pushing over and to change the two fare system. And, and, and my suggestion is for us, and I say, we as a city has a lot of influence because even though we rely on the MTA to run the bus services, but the city control the enforcement piece. And I believe, I don't know if you can share the experience at the Fifth Avenue, where we already been using the technology and the lighting system is synchronized to give preference to the bus drivers instead of any other drivers. So what is the experience that we have in Fifth Avenue that we can say this is something that we can expand through all the BSA, B, SBS and BRT so that the buses will continue moving rapidly than what they're moving right now because we can turn our buses as a above the ground train system. We have with the numbers of buses that we have and the number of bus lanes that we have and knowing that the buses they're running so slow and by enforcing we can see them we can see the improvement of efficiency. I would say that that's an area that we don't have to wait to have $10 billion to build another train because those buses are already connecting New Yorkers from Queens to Brooklyn or from Queens to Manhattan. Well, let, me, let me answer a few of the things you mentioned there, Mr. Chairman. It's no question, as I said in my testimony, with the 13 SBS routes that we've put up, we see generally improvements in travel time from 10 to 30 percent. And I, I just want to say up front, I hear you that, you know, at the moment I don't see a path forward with major new subway expansion, but I think the improvements we can make in bus service, I just, I don't want to leave the notion that it's going to be comparable, obviously, to running a subway line underground. I think we are working with the MTA and a lot of the things you've mentioned, improving uh, our, our signal timing, looking at all door boarding, off board fare collection. I think what the MTA has just done with its report on express bus service in Staten Island is very promising. The MTA went back and did a two year study looking at all the, uh, all the express bus service routes they've run from, many which they had not looked at for decades and decades, and realized that the, you know, the routes were making perhaps more stops than they needed to, that a lot of buses were going both to downtown and midtown, and that it actually made sense to send the one set of buses to one place and one set to the other, and then that gave them alternative routes when there are traffic challenges. So I think there is clearly a lot more we can be doing to improve buses around the city, and, and, and certainly on the de Blasio administration side, we're very committed to that. But, you know, it is another thing to say that buses will move as a train. I think that's always going to be a challenge in, in our surface grid. We can do everything we can to speed it up, but it's not going to have a dedicated right away, obviously, like a train would. Can we say that we're ready to see like a major improve or enforcement, in, especially in the bus lane? Because I agree with you. I was speaking to someone this morning, say he couldn't be on time, 
because the F train was not working. And if, if residents in Queens, they've been living with the seven train, you know, in the last couple of weeks, being out of services. And, the, you know, we know that experience, and we're working to address with the MTA the importance to do better on maintenance. And, but I think that with buses, we have some more control because they are running too slow in our city. So how, what can we expect on improving or enforcement in the bus lane? When we're talking about uh, uh, bus lane enforcement, uh, it's, it's a combination strategy. Uh, not only uh, police officers and uh, uh, NYPD resources targeting people who are violating the bus lane uh, regulations, but also uh, automation, technology, cameras that capture individuals who are going into those lanes and are in violation. Uh, it's certainly probably uh, more efficient utilizing camera system. So we would, would certainly support that. Um, officers, when we're doing enforcement, there's a possibility that when we pull a motorist over for being in violation of the bus lane, we then impact the bus lane ourselves also. So again, sometimes the, uh, the technology is probably going to be more efficient, uh, but again, it's certainly an area that the, uh, the police department can um, uh, add additional resources or have people to take a look at and focus on. Right. And, and, and when, I talk, when I look at uh, our enforcement, for me, I don't expect to see a member of the NYPD uh, who are fighting crimes to dedicate many of them now to, to go out and give tickets. However, having the traffic enforcement department, I would love to see increasement with the number of men and women in that area of the NYPD. So can you share with us a little bit on how are we doing, how many men and women are part of the traffic enforcement department? Uh, should we work together with the a, a, a support of the colleague here and the speaker to continue looking opportunity to see an increase in that division? One of the things certainly is, is that because the uh, individual who's in a uh, bus lane is actually a moving violation, he's going to be in a vehicle, um, we will utilize police officers to give out a moving violation, which is a B summons, which is returnable to uh, the Department of Motor Vehicle uh, Traffic Court. What happened is that um, our traffic agents in general doing enforcement are giving um, A summonses or parking summonses. So that would be the difference in that the two that we would distinguish a police officer and a traffic agent in terms of pulling vehicles over uh, because we require them to ask them for their license, their, their insurance information. Um, that's the difference between the two. In terms of traffic agents, uh, there is always going to be a demand for traffic agents. Uh, we get calls from our elected officials, and we have um, issues in terms throughout the city. We've had uh, some coverage also, uh, our traffic agents covering some of the school crossing posts right now. So again, um, I can certainly use more agents, and I think that the New York City Police Department along with DCAS are working to uh, process and to move as fast as they can to hire more agents and make it a more desirable position so that people will apply. Can, can you find out how many members are in the traffic enforcement unit as today? Currently, um, headcount in the traffic enforcement district is approximately 3,200 people, 3,200. And how many of those are dedicated to Midtown? I, would, I w wouldn't be able to okay. tell you exactly how many. We can get back to you with that specific number. I, I, I just hope that we, working together, can look at the numbers, see, because I, I believe that with the congestion plan that the mayor, you know, is sharing some aspect today, but I know that there's a more fully planned that the administration will be putting together on congestion. I just hope that increase in the numbers of men and women dedicated to traffic enforcement should be there because we need to declare Midtown as a, you know, as a zero tolerance area mm -hmm. or double parking, blocking, bike lane, and bus lane. You know, this, I think that this is not um, something that we have a lot of time to catch up. Like, it is hurting only the pedestrian, hurting the business community, it hurts in the city. And I think that I hope that, you know, that we can work together to see the increase of put together whatever human resources we need. The last thing that I'm gonna highlight is, or a question for it. You heard, and I know my colleague, Council Member Rafael Espinar is one of those here, that he's been 
put in resolution calling for the state to allow the city, or to pass a bill, the electrical bike bill. Has the city, are you, are you aware if the city is having any conversation with the state to uh, see a, that bill or any particular bill passing Albany so that FedEx and UPS and, and other members of the public who comp sector who do delivery for them to also know that the tools are there for them to look at bikes, uh, tricycle, and other type of... I'll, I'll talk about that, and, and Chief Chan may want to as well, but I just, I just wanted to go back on the bus enforcement, Mr. Chairman, just to highlight, in addition to whatever is happening on the, the personnel front, we also do think this is true in general in the parking and congestion area. The city does need to move more into automated enforcement, and you know, some of you may know we're currently authorized by the state to use camera enforcement in 16 bus lanes. We have 10 of those bus lanes currently camera enforced. The MTA actually also has the authority to put cameras in their buses and to enforce that way. They haven't been doing it yet, but it's something we certainly want to talk to them about because whatever the NYPD comes up with, we think obviously camera enforcement can, can you know, vastly supplement whatever they're going to do. On the e-bikes, I know it, it's been an ongoing discussion between DOT and NYPD and, and our leadership at City Hall the understandable desire to see what we can do to come up with a legal framework for, frankly, what is already clearly happening on the ground. We see, we see the use of them everywhere, but I know NYPD does have some issues about how you properly enforce. Yes, so we're, um, we're currently engaged with some, with some of the advocates on the e-bike issue in the state and how to properly define uh, the conveyance, because as you know, the, uh, the VTL defines uh, the different conveyances as a motor vehicle, something that's not human-powered, versus a conveyance that is human-powered. So I think it's, it's important, and we're trying to do it now, is to strike the balance um, f to define the conveyance properly so that our officers have the ability to properly enforce it and that we don't have true motor vehicles slipping into the definition without having to register their vehicles. But we're engaged in the conversation. Thank you. Now let's go to our colleague. And so I want to recognize Councilmember Coy. Now I'm calling Councilmember Koo for question. You put in the clock in five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez. And thank you, Commissioners and Chiefs uh, come here to testify. Uh, I represent a very contested area, you know, uh, downtown Flushing, which is only like a 10 blocks area, uh, but it's very, very congested uh, in terms of pedestrians and ve vehicular traffic. So uh, I encounter uh, like the following problems in my district. Now, we have casino buses, park, uh, like bus lanes, and they, they don't move. Even though they get a ticket, they just stay there. Uh, the second thing is that we see a lot of like, uh, trucks. Uh, you, they are not moving. They, they use trucks as a storage space you know, for commercial uh, vendors, either on the streets or the stores. They just park a big truck there and use it as a storage space for their fruits and vegetables. And even though they're ticketed, they're still there. I mean, they, every day for a few months, they're still there, a few years. As well. And the third thing uh, uh, I want to complain is that the MTA buses, uh, they don't use bus lanes uh, a lot of times. They drive on the other lane. The bus lane is empty. So how do we do enforcement on, on that? The, the fourth thing I want to complain is that <clears throat> I want to ask actually is, whether DOT has any roles in student line applications. Because in my area, I found out a lot of student lines are approved by these uh, consumer affairs, but they are on very narrow sidewalks. So uh, pedestrians have no way to walk. They have to walk on the streets. Because when you have student lines on sidewalks, people stay there uh, to look at the, pick the apples. They take a five, seven minutes to buy something there, you create a lot of congestion on the sidewalks. So I want to know whether DOT has any authority in, uh, in approving or disapproving 
uh, stood line license. Can you go to this question first? Yeah. Uh, we do do that work with the Department of Consumer Affairs, and there are city regulations about how much of a stoop sp I assume you're talking about a store taking up space. You meaning a store that has a display. There are certain Department of Consumer Affairs regulations about how much space they're allowed to take up if they're particular in, I think it's, I think it's three or four feet, I can't remember. If they're particular merchants that you think are encroaching on more of the space than they should be, then we can work with Department of Consumer Affairs to go take a look. So, I, I didn't quite understand your answer, yeah. So you have no authority over the application or? Or you just rubber stamp it's, the application? It's Department of Consumer Affairs, but our inspectors, they, they'll grant how much of the, you know, use of the sidewalk a given store can have. But if you think that that store is encroaching further than it should, then our inspectors can go out and work with Department of Consumer Affairs if, if they're encroaching on the sidewalk in a way that's not legal. So, so in the present process, you have no role in approving stood line license? No, I mean, the city has standard goals. Again, I think it's three or four feet. No, so they just go to consumer affairs. No application. Yeah. There's a okay. Okay. Because I found it really hard to understand is the city agencies, you know, especially the traffic department, they have no role in uh, deciding and the stood line license, especially in downtown uh, areas, which is uh, close to all the pu public transportation uh, entrances. They are taking up space, and people are very frustrated. Passengers are frustrated when they use the subways or they use, this, use the bus lines. They have so many the obstacles on sidewalks. People have to navigate when they want to go get on the bus or get on the train, you know. So look, it's, it's no question downtown Flushing has some of the most crowded sidewalks in the city, part of why we're doing the project to expand sidewalk space there. But again, if there's particular areas where you think merchants are encroaching too far into the sidewalks, happy to sit down with you all in Department of Consumer Affairs, see if they're meeting what the city requirements are, if they're exceeding uh, what we might be able to do in terms of, you know, curtailing that illegal activity. Yeah, I, I, my, my point is that the Consumer Affairs, they don't know anything about the, the, the sidewalks. They rubber stand all the applications. So I'm proposing maybe in the future, uh, we put Department of Transportation to be in charge of a uh, student line license. So this is just a, a suggestion. No. Okay, well, I'm, again, I, I, that, that would be a big assignment, but happy to, to follow up with you on it. I, th I think it's, from what I've heard, it, it's in some ways very much neighborhood by neighborhood. In some places, there's obviously issues where the sidewalks are getting very congested. In some places, people love having the merchants put their wares out on the street, so happy to pursue that one with you further. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Commissioner, before calling my colleague, Councilmember Levine, we did propose yesterday, again with Plan Move New York, uh, how do you feel? I know I personally have not seen details of the plan. It, it, I do believe that it is important to invite the private sector to be part of the solution because congestion required for everyone, including the private sector, to be part of this. And I think that this is something that for years has been discussed and tried to get over it to act on, but now this proposal it is a innovating one, and we heard that they also got some lawyers who also been saying that the city can do this thing at the local level. Now, of course, we need to be open as a city to discuss any proposal that we have on the table about how does the city feel in this case from the administration side. Well, let me, Mr. Chairman, echo what you say. I said it in my testimony. I, I certainly agree that we want to work very much with the private sector, with our major employers and institutions as we look at potential congestion solutions, both talking to our elected officials up in Albany and things as, like as Council Member Levine has discussed as we're rolling out working with them on, for example, more off-hour deliveries, which we want to do in a way which obviously will decongest streets but also not hurt those businesses. We want to make sure we're keeping our economy humming. We just got to look at what uh, the Move New York folks put out on Friday. I have to say many attorneys over a number of administrations have looked at this question very carefully. As you know, the last administration was a big advocate of congestion pricing and I think have all determined that the city doesn't have that legal authority, that we need to get that authority from the state. Um, 
So I think that's what our lawyers have concluded. And look, again, I mean, our own administration, as you know, even myself included, we've been up in Albany asking for the authority to do a lot of things. So it's not that we're not interested in wrestling those authorities back where we can, be it speed cameras, speed limit, mayoral control, you name it. But again, I think a lot of legal minds in the city have looked at it over the years and just have reached a different conclusion. Councilmember Maglami. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioner Trottenberg. Great to see you. Um, I listened to your testimony and, and then reread the statement, all eight pages, and I didn't see a comment on the bill that we're considering today, which I don't recall ever happening in a hearing. So uh, I guess I'll just ask you directly uh, the administration's position on the bill and specifically whether you support the idea of further studying um, the ways in which truck deliveries to stores uh, contribute to congestion? Well, I think the good news is we're actually doing a, a citywide freight study right now, which we're actually hoping to complete by the end of this year. So certainly we're looking at congestion as visa, and not just in Midtown, we're looking citywide. And as you heard me testify today, we are also, and this is something where I really, I think we would love the leadership and the partnership of the council, want to make an aggressive push to go back and renew the off-hour delivery program. But we recognize that and we want to try and reach out and get 900, for example, 900 new businesses to sign up. But that is one where you really have to work very carefully with local businesses because as you, as you said in your questioning, we do want to be sensitive. We're not trying to hurt mom and pop shops. I mean, we want to both reduce congestion but also make sure that, we, that our city is functioning economically, that businesses can get the, the deliveries and the services they need. So I think it's, it's going to be a very hands-on process and obviously one that will be informed by our analysis. So I think we, we support the concept of your bill, but I think we're actually sort of have some of that work underway. Right. I put small businesses and chains and especially big box stores in different categories. Uh, the big box stores are going to have staff to receive at any hour. A mom and pop store will not. So I'm very sensitive to that. The program you described that expired was voluntary, correct? Yeah, it was voluntary and we were fortunate we actually had a federal grant which enabled us to provide some financial incentive for participation. So you're looking to relaunch this program uh, funded by the city? It's, this will be a non-funded effort. Understood. When will that be launching? Well, we're, we're basically getting it underway right now, part of and my discussion today. How is recruitment going? Well, we're just getting started. So we're, we're, we've started some preliminary discussions, particularly to some of the big building owners in Midtown Manhattan, but I think we want to have a more formalized process. And again, I think we would want to do that in, in collaboration with elected officials and, and other stakeholders, the big you know, local industry groups. You'll hear from the partnership today and Rebney and the building owners, all, all those players. And when, when is your target for when the, this new pilot would take effect? I think it would be rolling. I don't know that we would need to do it all in one fell swoop. I think our, our target is to start to get it underway pretty seriously this year. Do you have a target for the number of businesses? 900 additional businesses. Okay. Additional. But the, the, the original 900 have reverted There was originally to... 400. Got it. And we're actually, we had, we had surveyed them a couple years ago, and now we're going to go back and resurvey them and see who's still participating, get their feedback, hopefully renew our bonds with them, and then add another 900. Are you calling it a pilot, or is this the beginning of what could be a permanent program? I, I guess we can call it a permanent program. Okay. Uh, we'll be anxious to hear more about this as it unfolds. Um, you only made passing reference to uh, congestion pricing in your statement, uh, only about a sentence or two, and you talked about, you called it controversial. Um, and in response to the chairman's questions, you referred to, I guess, political challenges vis-a-vis -vis of the state. But on the substance, what's wrong with a congestion pricing plan? I mean, look, this is an area that obviously has been debated, debated pretty extensively in the city and the state. Um, you know, we can look to some of our sister cities that have done it. You know, there's no question that when you start to charge for the use of roadways, people will change their driving behavior. Some may choose to use other modes. Some may choose to drive at less congested times. But it's also true. It can impose a financial hardship on people. Uh, you know, it can have other spillover effects. So... You know, this has been a great debate. I'm sure this hearing today will, will kind of bring that, that debate back to the fore again. Um, you know, I can just say again, reiterating from the city's point of view, I don't, I don't think we believe again that our, our legal experts think the city can pursue this on its own. It's Un understood. Just you know, we need to few, do with our Albany partners. Uh, a few seconds left. So one of the more vivid 
portions of your statement was comparing our plan for expanding the subway system to that of other cities. Uh, and I guess uh, even Los Angeles has more than 40 miles of track plan, and, and Paris, Los Angeles, um, London are all far ahead of us. Um, where is the funding going to come for New York City to catch up to our global competitor cities in subway expansion, um, which you described in the case of Second Avenue as reducing congestion if we don't find a new revenue stream such as congestion pricing? Well, that's a, I mean, I think that's the, that's the million dollar question. And I, I, I guess I want to give two answers to it. I mean, one is, you know, another trend, and there's been a lot written about it, RPA and other groups have talked about the fact that I mean, one other thing we have to, we have to I think, tackle is we're not getting as much for our dollar as they are, even in comparable European cities like a London or a Paris that are old and have a lot of infrastructure on the ground. So one, one challenge we face is currently our construction costs for subway expansion are vastly higher than even very comparable sister cities. So even before we add more money to the mix, I think obviously we probably need to find ways to get more for the dollars we do have. But your, your bigger question is an important one, and one I have to say I think it's, it's for the elected officials of the state to grapple with. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, a lot of jurisdictions around the country have looked at a lot of different ways to fund transportation with ballot initiatives and other things. In London, actually, there was a mention of private sector there. The private sector joined with their national government to put a lot of resources on the table. Challenge we have here in New York, I don't think our national government is going to be riding to the rescue with a big new influx of funds, but I think that's certainly for the city as we continue to grow and, and luckily grow and, and really prosper economically, we're going to have to grapple with that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to recognize Councilmember Kelo, calling Councilmember Lander now, followed by Councilmember Chin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner, and Chief. Good to see you. Um, I guess I'm going to start following on Councilmember Levine's uh, end, where he, uh, begin where he picked up, because I think your testimony is strong. But I, I'm really going to take issue with this one sentence. Looking forward, the city and region are unlikely to see the level and pace of transit investment necessary to meet growing travel demand and make a meaningful dent in congestion. It is surely true we are not on pace for it, but we cannot let that become something that we are assuming. And I agree with you that that is an MTA and a state and a gubernatorial issue. And I think we have a shared, everybody in this room who cares about it's got a shared responsibility to make next year's gubernatorial election a referendum on our subway and bus and transit service. But that is the solution, the only, I mean, like that's numbers one, two, three, four, and five for me about our congestion problem. And then six, I'm glad to start with all the other things we're talking about at this hearing. But if we can't get the significant level of revenue we need just to maintain, much less expand and improve our subway uh, and bus service, I just think we're going to be fiddling around at the, at the margins. And uh, look, I, I'm a strong supporter of congestion pricing as a way both to address congestion and provide revenue to invest in subway and buses. I worry about decoupling those things uh, truthfully. To me, they have to go together, um, which is why it's got to be done at scale where it can affect the subway and bus service. But I guess one question I have, you refer passingly to the citywide transit study, and I just wonder to what extent that will help shed some light on things we need to do, again, without the you know, significant increase of revenue at the level of London and Paris and LA. I don't know that it's going to matter, but I'm still uh, would love to know how it can contribute to helping build uh, the, the path to that future. I think that's absolutely right, and, and we've been working closely with you and many of your colleagues on it, and it's been a really good experience, and we've gotten out to talk to New Yorkers and businesses and community boards about. And, and look, one thing, as I mentioned in my testimony, when we have looked at other jurisdictions that, for example, have the ability to do ballot initiatives, what has won the day is when the voters see a concrete list of projects. And essentially, maybe they're being asked to, to pay more in some way, shape, or form, but they really see what they're getting for the money. And so I think having that study and having that list of what we can all agree are the important projects the city needs, as you say, for one, two, three, four, and five of tackling congestion, and two, obviously, helping mobility, helping economic opportunity, helping our economy to continue to grow. I think New Yorkers giving them a more crystal clear sense of what you know, what the potential next generation of projects could look like will certainly help us in what I agree with you is going to be a big debate up in Albany. And what's the timeline for that? I think I'm going to look over at Eric Beaton here. Fall. He's saying fall. Great. 
if all is good. That's, uh, as I I'll, said, I'll say I think, fall-ish, just to be a little careful. Oh, you heard what I think the strategy is here, which is making next year's gubernatorial race a referendum on our subway, bus, and mass transit service. It sounds like it will be out in time to help us do that. Um, all right, having said that, I think that's most important. I'll now move down to, I guess, what I'm saying is uh, six or below. Um, you, you referred to it in your, in your testimony, but I guess I want to push a little more on understanding the growth in for hire vehicle trips, which according to Bruce Schaller's report are unlike when we looked at it before, uh, a significant increase in the congestion problem. Uh, we, as a result of a range of, of both politics and that early data, stepped back from trying to do much about it, but that data certainly says it's time for us to come back to that question. Um, we've seen too much growth in one passenger for hire vehicle rides. Um, are we looking together at some ways, I mean, whether that's incentivizing shared ride or incentivizing less time that they're driving around in between trips or, I'm not sure what the answer is. It feels to me that should be part of what we're working on. I think you're right. It's certainly interesting. Between the report that the city did, basically in 2015, at the end of 20, the end of 2015, and then, you know, what Bruce has looked at since then, we've seen a real jump in the FHV sector. No question. If you have seen the report, I know Bruce will be testifying it. A real increase in those numbers, and the numbers are continuing to rise. And for the first time last year, we saw subway ridership decline. And I don't know that we yet have quite the granularity we need to sort of say what's causing what, and I think now that we're going to be getting, as I said in my testimony, more data going forward from the FHVs, and I give the TLC credit for really sticking I, to that. I, don't I think testified. I went there. Yeah, I don't think testified any Testified in favor. Thank you, because I don't know that any other jurisdiction is going to have the access to the kind of data that we have that will enable us to, to make the right policy decision. The policy decisions are challenging. Yeah. I mean, there's no question that anything you can do in that sector, it's, it's not without controversy. So, you know, obviously this will be the locus of that debate, but I think we will have really good data and analysis about what the impacts are, where they're happening, and what some policy levers might be. Right, and then my last question is just, isn't giving out 50,000 placards for 10,000 spaces the opposite of what we're trying to achieve in today's hearing? That's a tough question. Um, I think, look, obviously you've heard the mayor on this, and, and he stood with NYPD and, and DOT. You know, that placard decision was one made based on a set of lawsuits and, and labor grievances that went back to the original ruling by, by Deputy Mayor, mayor Schuyler. And, you know, I think we're not necessarily thrilled the way it all played out, but I think the decision was made. We had to get out of the business of litigating. I think you also heard, though, a real, I think, a fresh commitment to being very diligent on placard and placard abuse. And, and my agency, we in particular, have worked closely with DOE to come up with what we think is a pretty tight regime about how those placards can be used, about every individual who gets one being very personally responsible and accountable for making sure they're not using them in abusive fashion. You know, NYPD, is, as you've heard from Chief Chan, is going to be stepping up their enforcement. And we're going to continue what we're doing at the DOTN, which is looking at some of the bigger questions, technological, and fraud, you know, fraud proof improvements. There's technologies now that may make it a lot easier for us to do enforcement. And to look realistically at some of the places where we see the worst placard abuse. And courthouses come to mind. We just had, as you know, the mayor was just up in the Bronx for Bronx Week, and we all of us spent a lot of time on 161st Street standing around the, that area where the courthouse is. There is obviously a need for court officers and NYPD and others to go to the courthouses. So how do we figure out a sensible way, just Ticketing everybody or not ticketing it everybody probably isn't the most efficient way to ensure we can do those municipal functions. So we're really going to be digging in with NYPD and our, our, our parking blueprint to see can we come up with some smarter solutions so that if we can find some rational solutions, we can create that culture of compliance, which I think we all are longing to see a bit more of. Councilmember Team, followed by Councilmember Reacher. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner and Chief. Um, I just want to follow up a couple of questions. Placard parking. Um, it's really a mess down in low Manhattan, um, but we did get some positive results in Chinatown where, you know, our precinct, you know, took the lead and started posting up signs, and it's helpful. But I think in the rest of the low Manhattan, what's happening is that people don't feel it. I mean, they just, it's not even the placard. 
They put things that are expire or a little fold-up jacket that says NYPD or a little, little note that's saying that they are in, in a precinct or they are in a court officer. It's so disrespectful. And I think that it's more than just giving all of them a ticket. Maybe you have to start tolling. You got to send a strong message that they cannot do this. I mean, someone that are so blatant fake and they get away with it. So Chief Chen, I expect you, you know, this new policy to really step it up and really teach these people a lesson that they cannot abuse the law. How do they expect other people to follow the law when the people who are supposed to be enforcing the law don't follow the law? Well, well taken, uh, Councilwoman. What happened is that at one of the, the previous uh, hearings you, you mentioned, and uh, we spoke to the, uh, the CO from the 5th Precinct and also his XO, and uh, they developed a plan and I think that we actually had some very positive remarks from the community and even um, uh, one of the, uh, the blogs, uh, they were happy with the enforcement that they saw. A um, lot of these solutions are going to take a little while. Uh, now, for example, uh, the A4 precinct, we had an issue there. The local precinct that, uh, that um, covers the courts in that area developed a plan. The 5th precinct developed a plan. Uh, with the placard enforcement unit, uh, the additional traffic agents that are gonna come on board, and also with our individual uh, borough investigations unit, we are, you are going to see more enforcement out there, and you're going to see the, the days of those jackets and things and vests and things, that's gonna disappear. Uh, what happened is that uh, uh, the enforcement, uh, whether it be summons, uh, discipline, whichever the case may be, or towing, that is going to happen, and uh, uh, I think at, even at the beginning of when we had Vision Zero, uh, we had um, people who are doubtful that we can do that with additional enforcement by our officers. I think with the enforcement out there, you're going to see the compliance. I understand your frustration. I know that there are a lot of agencies uh, in uh, and around the, the lower Manhattan, but what happened is that with the, uh, uh, the effort that the, the mayor has invested and all the city agencies that have been notified, us notifying our law enforcement counterparts and our training for our uh, additional uh, traffic agents, how to identify um, fake placards and things of that nature, we are going to get to that point and we're gonna see a vast improvement in that area. When my colleague was talking about e-bite, we, um, together with my colleague in the district, other elected official, we've sent a lot of requests in the meeting because it is a big problem, especially in my district and in other immigrant districts, a lot of delivery people are getting ticketed, getting their bike confiscated. Yes, it's against the law to use electric bike, but we gotta find a solution. You know, these people, they need to make a living. Um, and oftentimes they also say that, you know, they're being targeted and, um, and getting their bike confiscated. So we really need to find a comprehensive solution about e bike you know, either we just like totally uh, eliminate it or that we have to make it a way that they could use it and be able to follow the law and not, you know, getting ticketed and getting confiscated and it's hurting their livelihoods. And they're coming to my office and they're coming to other council members' office. So we requested a meeting with NYPD and the other agency to find a permanent solution uh, to this problem. So I hope that uh, we can meet soon because um, the problem is, is continuing. Um, the other, you know, I don't have that much time, but the other issue about congestion, um, I, I thank you, Commissioner, about, you know, doing the study down here because there's got to be some interagency coordination because in definitely my district, as an example, you got construction going on, you got tour bus, you got, ex, you know, express bus, and it, everything is down here. I mean, anyone who live and work down here every day, they experience, you know, cannot walk on the sidewalk because some truck is parked on the sidewalk. So we really have to find a way to kind of make it a more livable city. Uh, people love to, you know, live in New York City. They love to live down low Manhattan, but it's getting really crazy out there. Um, flushing, I was out in Flushing, and I agree with my colleague. It's just too congested. <laughs> so... We look forward to working on uh, Thank you. Trying to we find we a agree, but both of the areas you're referencing, and of course Midtown, obviously require a multi-agency approach. We, we work closely with PD, but we recognize Department of Buildings. We've got to get a lot of our other partners in there as well to try and tackle those hot spots. That's what we're Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, for attending the hearing today. 
Uh, had a question on, um, so obviously we're talking about truck congestion. What is DOT doing to use our waterways more effectively? So we get hundreds if not thousands of trucks uh, deli making deliveries off of JFK uh, Airport, which obviously congests our neighborhoods. Um, then the council member Miller and I, myself, but I also know they are a major reason for congestion in the city, period. Uh, have you thought of any plans to use our waterways to deliver goods more effectively? Is there a citywide plan uh, that your agency is working on, or where are we at with that? It, it, it's certainly a, a big challenge in New York compared to so many other cities. We get over 90 percent of our goods by trucks. Most other cities, major cities in the U.S. have much better freight rail connections. Th this is actually an area where, where EDC is the lead agency, and I know they have been looking at potentially ways it's common sense that we can make better use of our waterways. Obviously, now we're going to start making better use of them with our ferry system. But you're certainly right. I think there's more we can be doing on the, the waterway freight system. But it's also true. I mean, obviously, there has been talk about can we make better use of potentially a freight tunnel or maybe the gateway tunnel can partially be used for freight. I think there's some other ideas folks are looking at about are there other ways we can get some of the trucks off the roadways. So I appreciate EDC certainly reaching out to so we can hear a little yep. bit more about that. Um, obviously, a lot of disinvestment, I would presume, coming from the federal government on transportation or concerns. Um, where are we at? How does that affect select bus service? Do you see uh, your agency moving wholeheartedly ahead with select bus service, or uh, where are we at with that? I, mean, I think the good news is, so far at least with the initial, uh, initial budget that Congress passed uh, with the new administration, Transportation funding was essentially left intact. Those of you know the President has now put out his more robust budget, which does call, fortunately, not for cuts really in the major formula funding, our major highway and transit funds, but looking at more of some of the discretionary programs that do fund new transit projects and tiger And grants. privatization. Yeah. Well, he has, yes. Then he has his own, uh, he's mm -hmm. put out sort of a six-page infrastructure plan, w which very much looks at how to improve permitting and, and streamline project delivery doesn't appear to put, I think, a lot of new money on the table, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But so far, I think transportation doesn't seem to be an area okay. where we're going to see big, I think, big changes in funding. Okay. So I think in terms of select bus service and the things the city's doing, we're going to continue onwards with our Woodhaven uh, SBS. We just got a good rating from FTA as a potential new start, and we're going to continue to pursue that federal funding. And then, uh, so this is, and I, as a Southeast Queens resident who un reluctantly has to drive in because mass transit has become so unreliable, um, you know, driving in is, it took me about an hour and 45 minutes to get in this morning um, from Southeast Queens, um, partly because of a lot of construction going on too. How do the agencies coordinate on this stuff? Is there a way that construction happening on these highways can be done more effectively. We're talking about truck delivery that night. Can, and I know it's never a, a right time to do construction in New York City, technically, right? But rush hour, you know, people are going to work. I'm, I'm assuming we're the most busiest between peak hours in the morning. Has there been any thought of moving construction tonight? Hours or couple couple answers on that, and when you ask, you know, who's I don't know if I'm crazy, but no, it's no, just, you know. <laughs> certainly not. It's a it's a question I get all the time, and it's a very it's a very good question. There is I'm actually fortunate in the moment to be the chair of a group called Transcom, which is actually made up of the 16 transportation law enforcement agencies. NYPD is a member, the big transit agencies of the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut region, and we do try very hard to work together to coordinate when there's major construction, when there's major incidents, like the Pope is visiting, you name it, and to try and use data and a very advanced network of coordination to try and anticipate, so that, you know, if, if, if New York City DOT decides we need to close the Brooklyn Bridge one weekend to do work, that the MTA doesn't close the, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel at the same time. So we try very hard to do that bigger coordination. And we have at DOT pretty strict rules about when construction can occur during busy periods. And I get a lot of complaints on the other side, a lot of frustration from contractors and residents about, well, why is a project taking so long? Well, if I'm only letting someone do work at night, that's going to add a couple of years. So it's, it's a balancing act, and one that I know can be very frustrating. And I think one question transportation agencies are starting to ask themselves more and more is, is it better to go to the public and say, 
I can shave two years off this project, but it'll mean 24-7 construction. Would you rather we ripped off the Band-Aid or not and, and have more of that dialogue? But there's always going to be that creative tension, unfortunately. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And I, I do have other questions, but I will respect uh, the Chairman's time. And I'll just put, uh, you know, we're, we're getting into these debates on, well, whose responsibility it is, mass transit is, it's the MTAs, it's the states. So therefore, the city shouldn't intercede. But I think it's a, it's a question that I think more and more we're going to have to entertain uh, a little bit more. I'm not saying that we should not have the state, you know, be responsible for what's going on in our trains and buses. But, you know, the city shouldn't necessarily say it's the state's responsibility, so we're wiping our hands with this, you know, uh, of this as well. So I'm hoping as we move forward that the city is also going to entertain a little bit more capital. I'm not saying that, and I know we put a billion dollars there, which is historic, but I think more and more from what we're seeing, I don't know if the administration is starting to look at it a little differently, but we can no longer pass the buck. New Yorkers don't know the difference between city and state. They don't care. They call our offices and complain about it. Um, so I'm hoping that while the state is responsible, that the city is uh, also going to continue to more aggressively look at ways to better the system as well. Not that you're not doing I, that. I, I appreciate that. And of course, for the traveling public, they don't know or care who runs all these agencies. And it, it's our responsibility as, as transportation professionals to try and serve them best we can. I will say the city's putting in two and a half billion in, in capital, not one billion. But I, I do think it's certainly a good debate. I mean, the MTA in its current form was created back in, I think it's 1968, at a time when the city was very weak. Financially and politically, the state was sort of the more powerful entity. And, and you know, it, it, it was structured to meet the needs of that time. It's 50 years later. I certainly think it's a fair question about do we want an agency that is both more responsive to city needs and, and potentially that the city's more accountable for. Mm -hmm. I don't know that anyone's come up with the right formula, but it's certainly, it's certainly a fair question to debate and, and one we would be happy to engage in. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioner, and to the others on the day is there. So, um, could you, uh, Commissioner, could you talk to talk about some of the projects that you have engaged in with the MTA, along with other city agencies, to relieve congestion through, uh, throughout the city, aside from select bus service? Well, I, again, I would, I would put select bus service at, at the top of the list. And, and I do just want to, I'll mention some of the others, but just expand. I mean, the other thing we do, select bus service of particular routes, and, but we haven't, I'll maybe have Eric say a few words about it. We work with the MTA every day to try and figure out how we can improve bus service, to look at traffic hotspots, to look at where routing, old routes don't make sense anymore. And I, I'll have Eric get into a little more granular detail on that. But I will just mention a couple of other things. Obviously, we've been very involved in the discussion of city ticket. And we're, mm -hmm. we're very pleased that the MTA is going to do that pilot and start it in Southeast Queens and parts of Brooklyn. And that's something we want to work with them very aggressively on. And as part of the city's capital investment, we, we did also sort of loosely earmark, particularly CBTC, which can help speed up subway lines and increase capacity, looking at stations where we need capacity enhancements. So I think to the extent that the city can play a role, we have been very focused on those questions. But actually, I think I would like Eric, who has really done remarkable work all over the city in partnership with New York City Transit on a bunch of ways of improving bus service. Sure, and to the point, we certainly don't wash our hands or our responsibility to help improve the transit system from the city end. And even beyond select bus service, you know, we're expanding transit signal priorities that the buses aren't caught at as many red lights. Looking at bus lanes, either on a full corridor or in targeted ways, or even just looking at how buses are routed so that buses aren't going out of their way, to, that maybe there's a turn or a street direction that we've changed over the years that's created hard places for buses to go. And by changing the, that, how those streets are designed, we can help those buses uh, go faster. So we, 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 I think we're not just doing what we can. We're also very much advocating with the MTA, using our connections, whether at, at the board level, as a, with the commissioner's role, or even just at, at staff levels to keep pushing for better ways to make these things happen. And then tapping into bus time, the bus GPS system, uh, figuring out where those buses are really getting caught up and not just saying the whole system is slowing down, but knowing 
this particular block in downtown Flushing or this block in downtown Jamaica, you know, we see a problem on a particular place. We work with you, uh, we, you know, we're installing a new bus lane camera where we've seen a lot of blockages of the bus lane. Yeah, attacking those at very granular levels can make a big difference too. That so, doesn't take away from the, from the need for the major investments, but we want to work at both the small and large levels. That, that, is, that is pretty impressive. And having worked with both agencies intimately uh, and been employed by both agencies, actually, um, <laughs> uh, over the past uh, few years, I, I, I know that there's tons of things that can be done, that, that things that, uh, that you guys have been very receptive to some of the ideas that we have talked about, agency coordination. But over the past decade, there has absolutely been none. And I worked in the downtown uh, flushing plans, and, and a bus stop would go up one day and go down the next day and, and, and we just couldn't coordinate. So I, I'm hoping that that would be the case. Um, obviously we've talked about being better efficient, uh, freedom ticket and, and other things, but we have express buses that don't run during the, the, the mm -hmm. off-peak hours um, in our community of downtown uh, mm -hmm. um, um, or southern Queens. We certainly would be, love to walk to the, the, the major thoroughfare and access a bus, an express bus into Manhattan, which does not happen. They also st don't come below 23rd Street when the majority of the folks work below 23rd Street. How do we coordinate that so that we can be more efficient in those efforts? But we talk about also um, enforcement and, and, and just coordination. Um, Sufton Boulevard, uh, Long Island Railroad, Air Train, EFJ. That is, uh, um, for many folks, the first New York experience that you're going to have. And this is an absolute travesty. Everything about it is bad. Mm -hmm. It's congested. Um, th there needs to be capital investment, and none of those things happen. And I will say that I was recently contacted by the NCO officer um, to have a conversation about congestion in that area. But certainly the local NCO officer is beyond his means, so I've asked DOT they're going to come in, uh, other agencies are going to come in, we're going to have a real holistic conversation about how do we do that. Um, but agency coordination is very important, and there are also agencies that have refused to address these issues, even these common sense issues, um, and how do we pay for them. And so um, I do, before my time, you know, I, I do want to say that, that before um, this committee, many times we've had this conversation, and I've talked about uh, as my colleagues, Albany responsibility, whether they come through lock boxes, whether they come through dedicated funding, mortgage reporting fees, and all those things that currently exist that are not making its way down to public transportation, mass transportation. We have to, as a city, ensure that everyone is doing their job, and I certainly would not be willing to commit another dollar for those who are already impaired um, because of lack of transportation options in Southeast Queens until other folks are living up to their responsibilities. And also, the comprehensive studies that this council has mandated have yet to come to fruition. And if we're not studying it, we're not talking about it, and we're not fixing it. And Southeast Queens continues to be that extreme transportation desert where people are suffering. And I, I don't expect those people to suffer. And on top of that, bear financial burdens. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to continue this conversation. It has been an absolute pleasure to work with this administration, and, and um, the Freedom Ticket, is, we're really excited about that, but there's tons more work to be done. No, no question, and I'll, Councilman, I'll try and answer a couple of those questions, and I, I know maybe Chief Chan will talk about the enforcement, because you mentioned the express buses, and I've certainly heard frustration from you and other members, and again, I just want to reiterate what I mentioned earlier in my testimony. I think the MTA, New York City Transit, it's very exciting, the study now that they've done looking at the express buses in Staten Island. They've, sent, they've found a lot of ways, I think, to potentially streamline and speed up those routes, and I know they're going to want to be looking at other parts of the city to do that. We're very excited to partner with them, Southeast Queens up in the northeastern part of the Bronx. So I think now that they're sort of getting in the gear of relooking at a lot of the bus routes and frequencies and all the other questions about express buses, that's going to be a great exercise and hopefully we'll find a lot of ways to improve service around the city. Commissioner, before uh, my colleague, Council Member Diane Garani, we ask a question. In page three, in your testimony, you share with us how other city they have a major transit uh, plan. Uh, as you say, in that part we say, when we look at per city across globe, 
we see that kind of major trans expansion is possible. Then you, you know, you mentioned London, $59 billion investment by 21. Uh, Los Angeles recently, they put their own initiative to raise $44 billion. What is our 10-year plan? Or should we have our 10-year plan that we can say public and private sector, we need to be, we need to sit in a round table and discuss from rezoning process how some benefits should be going to invest on transportation. Are we looking for any initiative that we can say, let's put together our whatever 20, 30 billion dollars plan for the next 10 years so that we can take our transportation system to the level of competition of those three other cities that you mentioned? I think that's absolutely the right question, um, and I think that's the way a lot of the other cities have approached this, this challenge, which is to have that vision of what, are, what is the next generation of major transit investments look like, put a price on it, and then try and come together with what resources are needed. Just to, to give some sense of, of comparison, the, the current MTA capital plan, and we just voted, I, I didn't actually vote for it, but the, the board just voted to amend that it's now $32 billion over this current five-year period. But the great majority of those funds are going just to maintain the existing system. We're not putting a lot of dollars into system expansion. So it is a very good question, I think, Mr. Chairman. What should a full, what, what should we spending, be spending in the next 10 years? How much should go for maintaining our existing system, which is old and obviously needs a lot of maintenance? And how much should go for capacity expansion? And what are the priority projects? I think that would be a very important exercise. And, and definitely I would bring into the speaker, to the suggestion to the, our speaker, Melissa Mabiberito, and the rest of the team, but I think it would be very interesting if we can put together like a group of individuals from the public, private, and the academic sector and invite those institutions to also bring suggestions so that we can put together our 10-year plan. You know, if we want to compete with those cities, we need to be more aggressive in that. And, and I just would mention, I mean, two, two studies that I think will help inform that discussion. Again, we're working on our own citywide transit plan, and I know that the RPA is looking to put out soon their, their fourth regional plan, which I think will also take yeah. a look at what some of the, and I know a lot of you have talked to them, some of what they think are not just the cities, but the region's key transportation priorities. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to all of you for your testimony. <clears throat> I, uh, I have the privilege of representing uh, Manhattan between 14th and 96th Street, and I do want to channel for a moment the frustration of my constituents about a problem that is a mess and has gotten materially worse over time. Uh, the quality of life impacts for people who live in that area or work in their area, whether it's the honking or the fumes or the inability to cross the street, whether you're a senior citizen or somebody with a, a baby stroller because you can't actually find the crosswalk, there's so many cars there, is something that, you know, we're really struggling with and we need uh, relief and we need to find some creative solutions here. Uh, that's just a normal situation. Now, of course, right now we have the Queens Midtown Tunnel problem. Uh, and I have a, a video um, on my phone that was sent to me by a constituent uh, of what it looked like over the weekend uh, where 2nd Avenue and 39th Street were just simply not moving. There was a fire truck that the firefighters had to get out of the truck to direct traffic to be able to get themselves to where they were going. Uh, there were reports of a couple of officers on the scene on 40th Street on Saturday, one of them on Sunday, who were so overwhelmed by the traffic that they simply uh, did not stay for a long period of time. I showed Councilmember Williams the, the video of what it looked like on 2nd Avenue on Saturday, and his comment was, is that a video or is that a photograph? Because it really nothing was moving at all. Uh, and I will share this with you. It's, it's really, it's rather shocking. But what I wanted to ask was about uh, the, the traffic enforcement district and the task force that exists, how many officers you've got, how you're deploying them, uh, because, you know, w we, need, uh, we need help, we need more officers, we need enforcement out there. Uh, Chief, we, we ask for uh, some guidance. What, um, Councilman Rodriguez had previously asked for the actual number of agents assigned specifically to, and I will get back to him with that number. But I would venture to say that Manhattan 
uh, and midtown congestion, that is one of the major priorities uh, for our department. Uh, a, a large number of our resources are deployed throughout Manhattan. Our traffic agents are covering uh, the, uh, the bridges, the tunnels, Lincoln Tunnel, uh, in the vicinity of Holland Tunnel, um, 59th Street Bridge, uh, and all these areas that are incoming into the city, certainly during the rush hour. The Queens Midtown Tunnel has a detail of uh, traffic agents who cover us, uh, specifically on weekends, because what happened is that the, the tunnel only has one lane in each direction. So we actually have um, personnel on the Manhattan side there covering it because of the uh, additional traffic volume and things that are nature. Unfortunately, um, sometimes we do have situations where there might be other events that are occurring in the city that will compound the problem of the, uh, the volume of traffic trying to move through that particular area. Um, but resources-wise, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, the Manhattan Traffic Task Force. This is traffic enforcement agents who are deployed throughout um, from 23rd Street all the way up to 59th Street uh, from river to river. And they're there specifically to expedite traffic uh, in that Manhattan core area. And what happened is that these agents, uh, it's very easy to spot them. They're in the uh, smart cars, and it says traffic on that. And they're to move traffic uh, along those corridors. They have specific routes that they're covering. And if they come across um, problems where we have vehicles that are double parked, um, blocking the bus lanes and things of that in nature, they will be, get out of their vehicles, issue summonses, but also actually physically come outside and move traffic themselves. Um, we have increased our enforcement towards no stopping, no standing, double parked vehicles, and those are uh, summonses that we want to uh, move traffic. And I mentioned that our model is to move traffic, protect our pedestrians, move traffic, um, and prevent collisions, move traffic, and continue to move traffic. Uh, uh, the volume of the traffic sometimes prohibits the agent from, if the, uh, the traffic street is, is full, filled, he cannot pull any traffic through any more than what's available there. We've, we've been working with the Department of Transportation, the uh, Midtown in Motion program and things of that nature, but again, we try to do the best we can. Each of the local precincts um, um, have their traffic teams and also uh, their executive officer overseeing their traffic safety programs. So we, as in the Transportation Bureau, support the precincts in their efforts to deal with traffic and uh, also to uh, do enforcement and things of that nature. Um, as I said before, I testified, we certainly would want more traffic agents because there are problems um, throughout the city that develop that we can use more personnel. Well, let me, let me just say that um, I, I appreciate that resources are limited, and I also appreciate that the volume outside that tunnel is so extraordinary that you would have to be almost superhuman to be able to navigate that. But what you see in the, uh, on, on the street and when you're out there, it, it, it looks and feels like the absence of any authority to actually move things along. Uh, the reports that we get, and I've seen it with my own eyes, is we, we just don't have enough personnel there. I don't know what other events are drawing them away, but we don't have enough uh, uh, resources there. And we're not diverting people properly away from the tunnel on the weekends when we know the tunnel is gonna be closed, at least in part, and it's gonna be creating this backup. So we need, we need support, we need DOT support. Uh, of course, we also need MTA support on this. Um, the last thing I will say is just a comment, and it's, a, and it's just uh, on a positive note here, Chief Chan. Uh, there is an agent who works down by the Brooklyn Bridge in the mornings, and she directs traffic, and she is fantastic. She is dynamite. She is one of the hardest workers that I have ever seen and passed by her, not infrequently. I called once, I don't know if the message got to you, but I just want to say it now today. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of great, talented people. This one deserves some recognition and praise. I have no idea what her name is, but I wanted to mention. Thank you. I, I wanted to follow up. We will take a look at, again, touch base with our counterparts in the Queens Midtown Tunnel in terms of personnel, the deployment of our agents in that area. And the agent you're talking about is uh, Guadalupe Rubino. Uh, if I could clone her, I would clone her and have hundreds of uh, models like her uh, w um, wandering about the city and helping us out. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I was around the Midtown uh, at the entry, and that's not my district. It's your, the one in district. But I saw how dangerous for pedestrians to cross by in that area because the cars there, they entry so fast. Are you looking at that situation? Because I was just waiting as a pedestrian 
waiting for a friend of mine to pick me up to keep going to Queens. And yes, standing there, I even think that I talked before, I can send this to you. How drivers, like, they enter through that area, like, so fast, and I see, you know, I don't know if you've been studying, if you've been looking at that situation, but my, I don't know if Dan also has been, is a concern that uh, something that probably NYPD should work with us? Certainly, any time uh, where we have the moving traffic, and we certainly are trying to expedite traffic coming in out of the tunnel and also going into the tunnel, but nevertheless, they are cognizant and they have to pay attention to our pedestrians because, again, that's our Vision Zero, and our Traffic Enforcement District is part of our pro program to protect our pedestrians, absolutely. Councilmember Cohen, followed by Councilmember Kelly. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, just briefly, uh, uh, Commissioner, I, I, I'm sure you've been following, but I wanted to give uh, props to uh, my borough commissioner, uh, Commissioner Lopez. Uh, we've been working very closely together on a plan to try to deal with some safety issues along the Broadway corridor, uh, and your agency's put in an enormous amount of work uh, in developing that plan through community engagement, a number of walkthroughs, and, and a very uh, thoughtfully developed plan. Um, but one of the, th the things is that sort of as we tried to get community buy-in that turned into a real challenge was sort of the distinct silo that DOT was working in without coordination, I think, with other agencies. And that really became a challenge because a large number of people from the community came out. I mean, God forbid, a bike lane. I mean, you know, what, what terror that causes. But the, the complaints that the community had had nothing to do with your agency particularly. They had to do with uh, enforcement issues. Uh, uh, that, that portion of Broadway runs along Van Cortlandt Park, and there were issues related to the park. Uh, and it was one of those instances where it just, uh, sometimes I feel at a disadvantage when I deal with the agency experts. They know their field, you know, and, and I'm not as well versed. But this was an, a moment where I felt like, wow, I realize that there's an intersection here between a lot of different agencies, and the agency, it did not feel like there was good interagency coordination in, in getting that to where we needed it to be. So I wonder if you could just talk about, like, on the borough level, how that works as opposed to, like, maybe on high. And first of all, I, I want to thank Councilmember Gorodnik for his nice remarks about the TEA. I, I have to say, we, they have very tough jobs, and I, I want to thank my own team, too, because being traffic engineers and planners in the city, they're out on the streets a lot. It, it's challenging work. So thank you for the recognition. Uh, it's very dedicated folks at both agencies who, you, you know, and you're correct, Council Member, that, that is a wonderful project, the Broadway project, and, you know, I think we're, we're going to continue to work with the community on it, but we feel like the safety benefits there are very, very crucial, as that's, that's been a notoriously dangerous corridor. We try very hard to coordinate at the, at the highest levels of agencies as well as down at the local precinct level. I think up in the Bronx, we've generally had really good work with the NYPD, but obviously you can certainly find moments where the public is frustrated and feels like there's been a disconnect and we need to do more together. And we hear that a lot when we go to the community. And it's good feedback for us. So to the extent that people are frustrated about things that aren't DOT, but NYPD or Department of Buildings or wherever it is, having those public meetings gives us a chance to try and fix those connections. And obviously, um, you know, we, we heard people's concerns up there. We're going to try and address them because we think that project is such an important one. And, and thank you for your leadership on it. I really appreciate your commitment, too. Uh, Chief, I will all, just echo some of the comments of my colleagues about uh, the, the abuse of plaques. Uh, you know, I, one of the things council members love dealing with is getting complaints from uh, the commercial establishment saying that all the metered parking is taken up by uh, illegal placards. And... The, you know, it, I don't know what you, you know, you said that earlier, I heard that it's going to take some time. I don't know what it takes time to tell the enforcement agents to enforce the law, but it's certainly not happening. I, I, I find those yellow vests to be offensive, that, that, that people are getting courtesy with that yellow vest. I mean, just plain old offensive, but it is very, very widespread. And I do think that also uh, one of my colleagues made this point, that it does uh, make people think that the NYPD doesn't obey the law, then why should anybody else? Councilman, one of the areas, uh, and again, um, it indicated that there is going to be an additional hiring of 100 traffic agents and things of that nature. Uh, year to date, uh, right now, we've issued over 12,000 summonses, two placards already. And uh, last year, I believe it was somewhere about 26,000 that we issued. So it's not as if that 
there has been no placard enforcement, but again, it's something that we're going to be emphasizing and we're going to be focusing, but 12,000 year to date as of uh, as this day as we speak. Thank you, Chair. Council Member Kello. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. In all honesty, I came to this hearing following its profile as considering a toll at 60th Street splitting my district, creating costs for residents who cross the street. Uh, so after I got elected, I came across an article in Wired Magazine, quote, the man who could unsnarl Manhattan traffic profile in Charles Kamenoff. I reached out to him and began using his massive Excel file and he's created and shared publicly. Uh, and so I'm a big person on data. And so I wake up every morning on 80th and York Avenue to gridlock and horns honking outside my window. This is not a unique experience. Currently traffic from Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester's, or points north or west. Use our local roads in the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, and even Manhattan to avoid highway traffic and tolls. Now, I support efforts to reduce congestion, but have concerns about efforts to simply create uh, new revenue sources. Uh, so I had a hypothesis uh, using DOT's screen line data, uh, which tra tracks how many cars travel between each and every borough crossing, uh, that if we uh, told all the interborough crossings instead of just the central business district, we could substantially reduce traffic congestion citywide. Uh, in fact, initial analysis found that tolling all interborough crossings instead of the central business district would have such a drastic impact that it would reduce overall revenue from a congestion pricing model that only focused on the CBD. Uh, would you agree to study the impact of tolling all interborough crossings and whether it in fact would reduce congestion to a greater degree than just tolling the central business district? And similarly, would you put greater value on reducing car trips and traffic congestion or on having more traffic and more congestion that just generates more revenue? These are big questions. I'm not sure I, I could commit to such a study today, but obviously we're, we're having a discussion today on all the, the proposals that have been out there on congestion pricing, and there are a lot of different views about ways it could potentially be done. I understand the, the concern about a 60th Street cordon, and, and I, I'll, I'll toss another thing out there for consideration, and I'm sure you'll hear from Bruce Schaller on this. A lot of what we're seeing, for example, with the with the app-based services is they're actually driving around Manhattan. They're not necessarily passing through a lot of cordons of any sort during the day. And so I think there are a lot of different ways we could look at potential solutions. Um, this is something obviously I would want to involve my city hall in discussions about what we might analyze in the future. But I, I take your point about looking at the, all the crossings of Manhattan versus cutting it off at a particular street. And I am a big fan of some of the software that I've seen your engineers using, specifically Eric, who I'm a big fan of. And to the extent DOT has the ability to take a version of that software and make it available to the general public to get to see uh, if they press a button to see what happens if you add a dedicated turn lane or something in some sort, I realize that may be very difficult. But any way you could show folks as we are changing different traffic patterns what the computer simulations show, that would be amazing. Sure, and you know we're limited in, in the software and what it can do and how easily it can be spread, but we do take the, the point that communication is very important and that even when we think that something is good, making sure that people understand why is that I, I would just love to see animated GIF exports uh, so folks can see the change in traffic patterns. Along the same lines, I love your testimony, love working with you. Please sign me up to partner on getting businesses to take deliveries in the evening. Uh, I also just want to- Thank you, we will. We will. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Chief Chan for your partnership on bike safety. It's something that another one of my colleagues brought up. And I want to thank you. We have the 17th and 19th precincts, which I say are the best in the city. And they've had support from you in terms of training their officers to do that. Uh, I would like to, however, ask for the Traffic Safety Task Force to support my precincts in doing the enforcement and adding it to our general totals. And in addition, for there to be a coordination between NYPD, DOT, and my office, and the neighborhood associations. Because residents every day they say, I see people breaking the law, but I never see enforcement. I'd like to go to 79th and 1st with Betty Cooper Wallerstein from the East 79th Street Neighborhood Association, stand there while we're doing an enforcement action so she can see it with her own eyes. Can you help me with that? The, uh, the NYPD and Al local precincts, we pair up all the time in terms of our um, having collaboration and also joint initiatives. So that, that should not be a problem. And what happened is that we've done that throughout uh, the city 
um, I didn't get to mention in, in Queens, we've done uh, numerous operations targeting uh, um, illegal liveries of vans and things of that nature, toll and towing vehicles uh, in the 103, the 113 precinct with the problematic. So again, we certainly can, love can to partner up. Can we do five our, operations per month in June, July, and August during the heaviest season? I will sit down and have my personnel sit down with the local precinct, the 17th and 19th, and we'll work out something where we can do joint operations, whether it be TLC or other agencies also involved. And I think just last piece, just to wrap up, we have a lot of double parked cars. I'm going to work with our DOT commissioner on some sort of pilot, but they get tickets. If we can just start towing them on York 1st, 2nd, 3rd, so that they know that they can't just stay there, pay the ticket as a cost of doing business, but that they will get towed. It's worked for Fresh Direct, and I believe it would work with a lot of the other folks who just do it every day. And I just wanted to mention on top of some of the traffic flow summonses that we've been working on, uh, no stopping, um, we've actually increased that, uh, 20,000 summonses in that area, up 28%, no standing, 352,000, we're up almost 10% in that category. Bus lane summonses, um, 7,322, up 59%, bus stops, uh, 97,000, up 10%, uh, traffic lane summonses, uh, up 66%, double parking, uh, we've written 224,000 summonses for that, up 19%. Block the box, uh, up um, 22,000 summonses in that category, and we're up almost 2,000% in that category. So we are working, we're targeting, and certainly towing. Uh, we're going to tow the vehicles that's, again, blocking the flow of traffic that's going to be on the hydrant and things of that nature. So we are working on that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Council Member. Now the last three Council Members are Council Member Chaka, who was here before. Councilmember Williams and Councilmember Reynoso, and then from there we move to the rest of the public. Great presentation and suggestion from public and from the private and academic to come after the administration finish testify. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you uh, for coming today and testifying. I, uh, I really have enjoyed the conversation that, that's been having uh, happening today, and I want to direct the conversation on the con in the concept of congestion uh, in light of the most recent uh, expansion of the NYC Ferry, South Brooklyn, Red Hook, and Sunset Park now have two stops uh, in the district. And it's really opened up the imagination of many of my constituents. And one of them uh, I said I would bring to you today about really thinking and utilizing our waterways as another method of transportation of goods. Uh, in this bill, uh, which I incredibly support this idea of, of DOT really taking a, a real responsibility of understanding how to remove congestion. How do the waterways play a role in this? Uh, Port Authority and EDC, two agencies, both alike in dignity in Fair Verona. I mean, these guys have been in constant both battle and now, and, and now uh, collaboration. How do you think about that in this question? Uh, because we're going to be pr pressuring you to do that. Well, I, I like the Shakespearean reference. It's very erudite. <laughs> That's um, how I feel it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, look, as I, as I did mention, you are, you're right. Traditionally, freight movement within the, the city family has been EDC-focused, and, and the Port Authority, obviously, is the big agency that is the mover of that between the ports, the airports, et cetera. But, look, it is certainly a fair question. As we were saying today in this hearing, it is one of the biggest challenges we have in the city that so much of our freight moves on truck. The congestion, the environmental, the safety considerations that that brings, I think it is an imperative for all of us to try and look for some fresh solutions. I do think, honestly, though, that is going to, for the waterways, that does bring up the question of potentially things like the Cross Harbor Tunnel, of really looking at how we can build out some major capacity. But I think you're also right, Council Member, the, the new citywide ferry service has, it has opened people's imaginations. And it, I think it's fair to challenge us to go back and say, we're looking at new ways to move people. What else can we do on the freight front, on the waterways? It, it's been a lot of fun to see the service get up and running. Well, since, since, since there is a lot of uh, openness that I'm hearing from you, I think, I think it, it's, it's imperative that we move forward with, with a kind of small scale demonstrations of how we can think about really opening up with some things that we can actually demonstrate, uh, things and goods that come in and out of Red Hook. 
Uh, I think you heard from, from the sponsors a little bit about our big chains versus our smaller businesses that I think are, are more connected to the local economy. Sunset Park and Red Hook both kind of stand for uh, not just the investment that's coming in from the city uh, at Brooklyn Army Terminal and, and Bush Terminal and SBMT, uh, but also at the Red Hook Terminal, where its future really is, is dependent on us uh, thinking about it in our future. And I think there's so many rumors right now about the Red Hook cranes be disappearing and, and luxury condos coming in. Uh, we want to we want to kind of send some strong signals to the market that this is a vital component. And DOT, I think, needs to be at the forefront. And not just let EDC, which has a kind of one mind uh, set, which is which is what they're supposed to be doing, economic activity, but really thinking about it in transportation. Uh, which me leads me to my last few items about how we really think about a, a kind of focused area about the waterfront. So if, if you are open to waterways as, as, as a reliever of congestion, then how do, how do we really place leadership within your agency to say, got it, we have a czar that will take care of this and think about it with you, council member, z council members, because I think multiple uh, council members represent wa waterfronts that can engage you and really bring the public, our small businesses and our residents to talk to you. A lot of this is uh, mixed use in nature, our waterfront communities, um, and which also bring up other issues like impacts from the ferry, and we've been talking about the, the, the traffic light on Van Brunt Street at Pioneer. It's just one example, a Pioneer and Van Brunt, uh, one example of other things that will be impacted as we think about congestion rising through infrastructure like the ferries. Well, I think I'm, it's not for me to appoint a czar for the administration, but certainly a good discussion to have with us in EDC and, and City Hall. Uh, and, and, you know, look, I, I think you're, you're right. I think I, I, you know, I applaud the mayor and, and EDC for, for taking a fresh look at our waterways, and I think the mayor has spoken very eloquently about the fact here we are, a city of islands with all these remarkable rivers and waterfront communities. And you're right, in Red Hook, obviously, you have a lot of big box and industrial uses on the waterfront. Certainly, I think if we put our heads together, we could come up with some good solutions. I'm happy to say on the, the signal, we're hoping to get you an answer in the next couple of weeks. So, it, right. you know, we are accelerating on that one. And, and, you know, I know it's frustrating, but hopefully we'll have an answer soon. Morgan, thank you for working with us on that. Thank you, Chair. Councilmember William, followed by Councilmember Henry Rosa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner et al., for, for the work you're doing. My, uh, my question really is around uh, congestion pricing, because I know that they're going to be, uh, we may hear some presentations um, soon. Um, and so it may have been talked about. I'm sorry if I missed it. I was a big supporter of congestion pricing previously, and I assume I will be again. And I just wanted to hear what your thoughts were on it. And if you're repeating it, I apologize. Uh, but I wanted to hear what your thoughts are in general. Yeah, um, well, what, what we testified to earlier today, and you will be hearing testimony today, a, a new theory that the city has potentially the legal authority to do some sort of congestion pricing or tolling. Just, I think what, what I testified to is, I think legal experts for various administrations, including the current one, have looked at this legal question and do feel that it really is an authority that has to be derived from the state. And, and as I said, it's, it's obviously been a big and controversial debate up in Albany, and one that I know a lot of council members here, and I think actually a growing number, feel perhaps they want to urgently make that case. Uh, you know, and, and I, I think as we've seen in other cities, it can be a tremendously useful tool in, in London and Stockholm and other places where they've done congestion pricing. They've seen congestion be reduced by as much as 20 percent, which in this city would make a real difference on the streets. So the administration is supportive of the concept of congestion pricing? No, I'm not going to say the administration is supportive. I'm going to say we looked at the question for the purposes of this hearing about whether the city has that authority absent authorization from Albany, and I think we've concluded the answer is no. I think the mayor has said on this, he just doesn't think at the moment this is something Albany is, is going to be granting the city and, and not something he's going to put on the top of his list. So in the, in, in the dream world where the city can do it, what is the DOT's position on the concept of it? I, I think I, I don't think there is, unfortunately, a dream world where the city can do it. I think it's something, it's not really a, DO, it's not really a matter for DOT. It's really a matter, I think, for the elected leadership of this city and the state. Uh, you know, to come together on, could you come up with a congestion plan? Hearing just even from your colleagues, there are a lot of different views about where you would do it, how much you would charge, whether it would be coordinated. I, or I'm just, I guess I'm trying to get at what the administration's belief in the concept is, because it's hard to, uh, for even us to come up with things if the, if the administration is opposed to the concept, supportive. It sounds like you said some nice things that happened in the other cities, so I just wanted to get a, if, if, I guess there's no official position on the concept now. I just really want to 
kind of understand where the yeah, mistake I, I, I Again, I'll, I can just channel what the mayor has said, which is, you know, at the moment he doesn't think this is something that's really going to be a viable debate up in Albany. It's not something mm -hmm. he's put on the top of his list. So I think that's the best All I right. can say about that. So we're not going to get into whether there's a support for the concept or not support for the concept. <laughs> um, but I just want to make sure I, again, put my voice on the record. Last time I had uh, constituents that actually were opposed uh, to it. And I think um, there was a lot of confusion because uh, most of the people who were opposed to it probably take, would not have been uh, um, affected by it because a lot of my constituents don't drive in the city. I think there's just this feeling of feeling nickel and dimed whether or not it's uh, on them. Uh, but I hope to uh, convince them otherwise uh, once this begins to move forward because um, strap hangers always uh, feel the brunt of increases and for folks who drive cars like myself um, actually don't. Let's take battery tunnel and what have you. And uh, obviously, we want to deal with the congestion at the bridges. So I want to make sure I put my voice on there. And my hope is sooner than later we can get past the uh, Albany, not Albany, and really get to the heart of whether we believe it's a, issue, a good issue or not, because uh, the mayor has uh, at many times uh, went to Albany for things he believed was important, whether or not it was successful or not. And so this might be one of those things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilman Reynolds. <clears throat> Hello, Commissioner. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. Um, just wanted to ask, I, I know you made references to uh, several cities outside of New York that have some type of pricing uh, that has actually reduced congestion and in some cases a significant amount. Um, so uh, I'm just going to read into that as to, uh, you know, something that I know DOT specifically to do very well is look at information and data and make decisions off of information and data. Uh, and given that that's the information and data that you gave us, I'm gonna s feel comfortable should that conversation begin regarding congestion pricing that you will land on the right, on the right side. Um, I'm not saying which side that is, but I feel conf confident that you will always land on the right side of that. Um, but I think where, what I wanna get to, I guess, is I believe the problem here are vehicles. We have more vehicles than ever and more people driving those vehicles than ever. We have less people riding buses overall, or ridership is going down there, but it is increasing in the subway system. Um, so there are modes of transportation that are preferred throughout the city of New York um, to, to some folks like me that are pretty obvious. Um, in the MTA, in an effort to increase, uh, the, I guess, the, the quality of ridership, uh, I'm going to call it that, the quality and safety of ridership. You know, they continue to do upgrades to its infrastructure um, and in doing so need a lot of money. And they need a lot of money and they get some of that through increases on a regular basis for their fares. Now, other infrastructure in the city of New York that doesn't have a toll-based system or a fare-based system don't get the exact or the same amount of love, let's say, that an MTA system would be able to get through a fare system. So for me, until we don't tackle the issue that we need to de disincentivize, or de incentivize folks from driving cars, and that that be something that the city does publicly and state publicly, that people gotta get out of their cars and move to other means of transportation to make this a more livable and viable city and a more uh, progressively, uh, progressive transportation city, um, it's gonna be very difficult to do. It doesn't matter where you live, you have to understand that vehicles are what's causing the congestion not bike lanes, not pedestrians, not sidewalks, not speed cameras. It's the vehicles. Get out of your car and things will move easier. And if you don't want to get out of your cars, then you have to suffer, suffer repercussions. We're not going to incentivize you to do it. We're going to actually tow you. We're going to tax you. We're going to do other things so that you can get out of your vehicle. Um, I just, I guess, my one question is, what is the city's position on vehicles being the primary uh, culprits, I guess, or whatever, um, regarding congestion in the city of New York, that they are the problem, and whether or not the Department of Transportation is prepared to do something about that. Well, I mean, by definition, vehicles are the main cause of their own congestion, and certainly as a joke, if you're sitting in a car complaining about congestion, you are actually part of the congestion as well. Thank you so much for that. I, 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 think, I think our approach has been, because again, we don't, you know, at the moment we don't have congestion pricing as a tool, is at least to try and provide the best possible options and incentives we can for people to get out of our cars. The number one way to do that is to have a good mass transit system, and we've had a good discussion today about the way the city's is trying, the city 
city is trying to partner with the MTA on that, but that some of that is some sort of bigger, more existential questions about how we can continue to seriously build out our subway system. But we're looking at all the other routes, as you've talked about, you know well, because you've worked with us on building out our bike network, on city, on expanding city bike, on expanding a ferry system, and things that we're looking at now like car share, which we do think can really be a way, if we do it well, to potentially enable you know, you can have one car share that 10 people can essentially shed and a bunch of those uh, can share and a bunch of those people can shed their cars. I think another model that we're starting to see it's emerging now in Asia is a bigger bike share model. You've, you've probably heard about cities like Shanghai and other places where tens and tens of thousands of bikes are coming onto the streets. I think there could be a lot of challenges to that in terms of safety and, and the orderliness of the streets, but it may be a real way of really doing some real mode shift. If there's that much availability of bikes, that may also induce people to give up their cars, for cities to give up more of the space that's dedicated to parking, for example, and use it for bikes. So I think there are some trends on the horizon that I think are going to continue to help induce people and provide other modes for them if they want to give up their cars. The, the last thing I would say is, uh, you know, I, I, not the administration, no one in the administration, sure, but I believe that um, everything we do to make it as uncomfortable as possible for folks to continue to buy new cars and continue to travel in vehicles is a good thing for the city of New York. I personally think that. I need, folks need to understand that it is a climate change issue, tra congestion issue, um, and just infrastructure uh, destruction overall. Um, and then safety issues. More people are dying and people die. Vision Zero, we haven't been able to achieve it yet. And it's because of vehicles, and that's another thing that people have to understand. It isn't because of bikes and pedestrians. Again, it's vehicles. Vehicles are the problem. And so we don't publicly start addressing vehicles. Um, this is going to be something we're going to be talking on long after we're no longer elected officials or commissioners and so forth. I, I would just say I think it's very hard to generalize about a city as big as New York. They're, they're, they're big parts of the population where you're fortunate enough to live very closely to one of the most remarkable subway systems in the world. But then there are big parts of the city where people are pretty disconnected from the subway system. Our employment patterns in some places, they're dense. If you're working in Midtown or Lower Manhattan, it's probably pretty easy, or downtown Brooklyn, easy. You have a lot of transportation options, but if you're working in some other places, not so much. So again, I think a policy that is looking for alternatives and particularly connecting those parts of the city that need better transportation connections will help achieve your goal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Councilmember Levin, who is here, and my two colleagues had like a 30 second question. Thank you. First, I wanted to thank you, Commissioner, um, for walking with us looking at opening Park Row for pedestrian and bikeless, so hopefully that will make it safer for them because they just can't go down Wall Street and St. James, it's just crazy with the congestion. My final point is the, uh, uh, the two-way toll on the Verrazano Bridge. If we could fix that now, that would ease a lot of construction on Canal Street and Broom Street and all the street that leads to the Holland Tunnel. I, I'm ha and thank you. We enjoyed the walk on Park Row, and I, I think it'll be wonderful if we can create a more pedestrian and cycle-friendly environment there, and I think we're going to have a great partnership with NYPD counterterrorism and figure out ways to do that. I'm happy to say that the, the MTA Bridges and Tunnels Division is now actually taking an, an, a serious look at the question of two-way tolling and looking at the data, so I think when we get that data back, it'll really enable us to look at what, what the benefits would be potentially for Brooklyn and Lower Manhattan, what some of the implications might be about where the traffic would go. So I think we're going to have some real data, and that's really going to help all of you that are decision makers. Ultimately, as you know, we need to get congressional authorization down in Washington to, to change that tolling, because that was something done uh, at the congressional level. But I, I'm hoping we'll have good, good data there, and I know um, Congressman Donovan has certainly expressed an interest in seeing that data and having that discussion. He would clearly be a, a key player if we were ever going to reverse that tolling policy. No, thank you. Thank you. And I'm also asking my Republican colleague in the city council to join us and help us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. So, um, Commissioner, I'm so glad that your last uh, comment about the uh, congestion pricing, including the uh, 
uh, how services get delivered, equity, or the responsibility of public transportation, and those options throughout the city are not equitable throughout the city. And, and so that remains my argument, and I always look to reinforce that, that in communities that are transportation deserts, until we address those concerns, then it would be um, awful that we overburden those communities that's already burdened. Um, Chief, um, I, I just have a question on, on, on uh, enforcement and in particular uh, vehicle, uh, in the summonses that are issued, those vehicle summonses as opposed to traffic and actual traffic enforcement summonses. What I don't see in particular in the downtown Jamaica area is those uh, bus lane uh, enforcement that uh, no standing 4 to 7 and so forth enforcement um, that really keeps traffic moving along and prevents congestion. I see more of the vehicle summonses and, and on the off block and uh, that, that generate revenue as opposed to address the issue of traffic enforcement. Do you have numbers of summonses um, uh, uh, around traffic enforcement uh, as to, uh, against vehicle enforcement and just uh, revenue generators? I mentioned earlier uh, in the Queen South area, and I'm going to divide it by the 113 precinct, also the 103 precinct. In 2016, um, we towed 84 vehicles uh, in the uh, 113 precinct, and then 103 precinct, we towed 639 um, uh, vehicles. In 2017, in the 113, we, we wrote, uh, towed 32 uh, vehicles, and then in the 103, 202. Now, with those vehicles being towed, they had to be issued a summons first for a parking violation first. And quite often those are um, uh, vehicles that may be blocking traffic um, and we want traffic to move. So certainly that's what we did in the 113 and also the 103. Some of the programs that are through, as we mentioned earlier, uh, with the our NCOs in the 103 precinct, uh, in, Inspector Kappelman there, Parsons and, and Archard, and also Suffern Boulevard and Archard, uh, they've issued parking summons there. In, in April and May, they've done some operations 51 parking summonses, 119 movers, um, and also, um, so again, we are targeting those areas, uh, working with our NCO. That NCO program is very effective. Yep. The officers understand what the problem is. So with is. all due respect, yes. if you look at the numbers from versus last year to this year, the numbers are down tremendously. Uh, is that because of the, uh, the, the case that, that, that was, did not allow the city to tow the, the, uh, the commuter vans? And, and, and quite frankly, 150 summonses is woefully insufficient. You can do that in two hours down at, in, in downtown Jamaica. Those were actually done during specific operations. Doesn't, that's not the total number we didn't specify. But uh, I would still submit that that's woefully insufficient considering that is the major transportation hub down there. And we really need for agencies to coordinate. We passed legislation forbidding uh, uh, the commuter vans from operating there. Mm -hmm. And let me just say while we still have the uh, commissioner there, um, that bus lane has cameras and it has cameras everywhere except for at the subway stops where the commuter vans congregate. And I, I, that's an absolute oxymoron, it just doesn't make any sense there. And you talked about um, police issuing summonses. There is a controversy as to whether or not they are violating their right to actually pick up or drop off in a standing zone Sorry. as opposed to Sorry. So, Whether uh, or not it's a summons. Uh, just on the cameras, council member, in, in light of your concerns, we have just installed a new one. Eric Beaton was just saying at 153rd and Archer, which we hope will help get at the, the commuter van issue. Great. Council member Levin for one question, and then my colleague here who also was chairing the hearing on planning on land use, he also will be asking questions. I also would like to acknowledge council member Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, um, and the rest of the panel. Uh, quick question, and you, you addressed this, I think, largely in your testimony, but, um, and, and somebody might have asked this already, but do, do, you, do you see congestion as an, as an ever-growing problem? Or is, is it getting, if you were to uh, quantify or qualify it, would you say it's getting, it continues to always get worse? Does it ever get better? I mean, certainly when we look at the, the taxi GPS and bus speed data, it has gotten worse in recent years. Throughout the history of New York, I mean, 
Congestion often has a lot to do with the economic health of the city, so there are periods when I first lived here in the early 80s, wasn't so bad, and you could find a parking space too, but I think that was times when the population was much smaller, we had much less job creation, construction, tourism, all the factors now that we think uh, you know, come into play at congestion. To some degree, I think there is a notion in economics that at some point congestion is self-correcting, which is it does, obviously it, it, it can't continue infinitely. At some point, people will start to use other means. But again, I think the challenge we have now in this city is we need to give people those other means. And you know, I do think when you're looking at what some of our sister cities are doing, they're making major investments in transit. That's, that's the key way to get people out of their cars. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Councilman Grimford. Thank you, Chair, for the indulgence. I apologize, as the Chair mentioned, I had a concurrent hearing that I was chairing next door on the Land Use Committee. Uh, just to have uh, a thought and a question related to that, and I certainly appreciate all the work that the Department of Transportation as well as the NYPD does in relation to congestion. I know it's, it's a difficult battle, and as you uh, point out, Commissioner, it seems like a losing battle, partially, quite frankly, because of the popularity of uh, the city and economic development as well. One of the challenges that I know we've discussed is the fact that we have hundreds of thousands of trucks on the road each and every year. We get our goods primarily through truck as opposed to uh, rail. Uh, I'm curious whether uh, you would consider supporting the uh, adding a freight capability to the proposed gateway rail tunnel under the Hudson River, which while it wouldn't solve the problem, would certainly have the potential of taking many thousands of trucks off the road so that we can get more of our goods here by rail, as most of the country does, as opposed to trucks, uh, not to mention, obviously, security and other issues which would be improved by the virtue of bringing in things by rail. I think uh, all of us know that trucks are really one of the biggest sources of frustration, congestion, and also uh, harmful to the environment as well. I, I've certainly heard some of the, the ideas for proposals to do that, particularly maybe at night to some degree, the, yeah. the tunnel could function also as a rail tunnel. It could even be revenue generating. I think the challenge that we're looking at on the city side is once those trains come into Midtown, then how do we get that freight up to the surface and distributed? But certainly I think that's, I know some of the folks who are involved in, in running the Gateway Corporation and I know it is something they're considering. Right now I think they have perhaps a more existential question which is making sure that there is some financial commitment from the two states and the of federal course. government to see this project go forward. And I think, of course, there is ability, uh, once it does come to Midtown, to your point, to get it to uh, Brooklyn and Queens through existing uh, infrastructure. And I certainly agree with you that there is that issue of whether or not it's going to happen. But I'm just curious as to whether that's a concept that you might consider endorsing as a possibility of bringing in, uh, bringing in freight via train, at least some freight, as you point out, during the night, and certainly as someone with your uh, federal background and expertise, you can uh, appreciate how that might be helpful. No, I, I, I think it's, it's intuitive, seems like it could be a good idea, but again, I would, I would want to know, I need a little more detail on what, what it looks like in terms of passenger frequencies, because, you know, another phenomenon we're all looking at in this region is that the travel between, trans Hunstead travel between New York and New Jersey is also projected to grow quite sure. extraordinarily. So how much capacity would this tunnel have to spare and how would we on the city side, where would we receive the freight? How could we work that in terms of the right. actual physical characteristics of the tunnel? Where would the truck stage, you know, there's sort of the, the land side questions on the city. I'll follow up with your office on some of those uh, suggestions and recommendations that we've gotten for uh, the advocates and I do want to thank uh, the NYPD as well for uh, their focus. Thank you, Chief. I know that you get spending a lot more time on transportation issues here in the city as a police department, and we recognize that, and we're grateful for that, and we're seeing less uh, congestion in some spots, but overall safer streets, which I think is good for everyone as well. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson for one question. Yes, I'll be very quick. I just want to make a quick statement and then a quick question. So, uh, Commissioner, good to see you. Thank you all for being here. You know, my district, which covers the neighborhoods of West Soho, Hudson Square, near the Holland Tunnel, Greenwich Village, the West Village, Chelsea, Flatiron, Hell's Kitchen, a little bit of the Upper West Side, Columbus Circle, Times Square, the Theater District, the Garment District, the Javits Center, the Port Authority Bus Terminal, Penn Station, Moynihan Station, it's a heavily congested district. And each one of us in the council represent about 170,000 constituents, but the average daily population of my district is about two and a half million people because of all of that. And any day, no matter what day it is, except maybe Sunday mornings, six other days a week, 6th Avenue, 
7th Avenue, 8th Avenue, 9th Avenue, 10th Avenue, and 11th Avenue from 14th Street to 59th Street. It's, it's just gridlock. It is just gridlock. I mean, honking, trucks, double parking, deliveries, inner city buses, it's chaos. And it is such a big problem. It's pro it might be the biggest complaint that I receive on a regular basis is the level of congestion in the district on all of the major avenues, on the major thoroughfares going east to west, 14th Street, 23rd Street, 34th Street, 42nd Street, all of those as well. And so I just wanted to come here to say that we, re we need a real plan. And for me, I support congestion pricing. I don't know much about what is being discussed today with the new proposal, but I support congestion pricing because I really feel like we need to do something. And on a lot of the great things that your agency has done, this is not me in any way minimizing it, but these things are things that I asked for and the community asked for, so I'm extremely grateful. But it feels like tinkering around the edges in some ways, that they're important things, but they're not transformational things. They're not things that are actually gonna relieve the problem of major congestion. And my own thing is we just have to disincentivize cars from coming into the city. And the way to do that is through congestion pricing. So I don't know if there's anything, I know you testified I wasn't here for it. Um, I read your testimony. I don't know if there's anything that you wanna say in response to kind of that statement I made, but I just wanted to come today because I experience it on a daily basis in my district and so do my constituents. And I really just wanna work with you all on a plan that fixes congestion or leaves congestion in New York City. Thank you. I, I will respond, and you know, it's interesting, as a lot of you know, the mayor has been doing town halls all over the city and all the council districts, and, and I think when we, we did yours, I said to you at the time, council member, your district is pretty unique. I mean, I have to say, obviously, you possess in your district, I think, four or five of the biggest transportation facilities in the world. And so it, it, it's absolutely true that I think some of the day-to-day -day work we do, we have some, some titanic challenges, how we deal with the major Hudson River crossings, a new Port Authority bus terminal. I mean, big projects that certainly the city plays a role, but they involve the state, they involve our regional partners. You know, I think we are working very hard, and some of my team is here that have been particularly engaged on the front lines working with the Port Authority and kind of the granular how do we improve traffic flows around the tunnels, which is a huge challenge, but also the bigger questions of how do we improve Trans Hudson challenge in general? How do we reduce congestion? How do we provide more ways to travel between New York and New Jersey? So there's a granular piece and a big picture piece. And, you know, again, happy to continue to engage with you. I do recognize your district is, is unique in that regard. I think it's fair to say you have the biggest impacts, transportation impacts in the city. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for dedicating almost three hours, uh, or more than three hours, almost four, to this, to be taking all those questions. And, and as, as I said before, uh, this is one area that I heard New Yorkers across socioeconomic and ethnic background. Congestion is a problem that we need to resolve. And I'm happy to hear, you know, on how Mayor de Blasio, through you as a commissioner and Chief Chan is so committed to invest to address uh, the situation. I know that today we heard good ideas, good suggestions, good initiative. I hope that this is only a beginning for something that we know is so critical for all, for all private and, and, and public sector. Uh, I hope also that we can work together with that idea to put together a group of individuals that uh, allow to a brainstorm and take the best a suggestion on how we can put together like a 10-year plan a, related to in, in funding, transportation, and also addressing the issue of a, con, a congestion. One thing that I want to say to Anne is that I'm one of those 1.2 million New Yorkers who own a car. So those of us who own a car are not the problems for congestions in a city uh, by itself, because in order to reduce congestions and to get New Yorkers who own cars to switch from car ownership to public transportation, we need to modernize our transportation system. Uh, 
I know that my experience will be able, I live most of the time, I train on my car on 96 and Broadway, and I take my train every day. But for me to drop out my daughters in the morning to two different school and be able to come here at nine in the morning when I have medium hitting is impossible. So I also, I'm familiar with the experience of New Yorkers who live in Queens, that they had to walk 15 blocks to, for, to take a train. A teacher who worked in a school in the South Bronx, and they had to walk 10 blocks to go to their school. We, in order for us to reduce cars in the street, first, we need to address those car drivers that they come from out of the city. That's one group. Second, we need to create better condition for those New Yorkers who live in transportation deserts area. And we know that we passed one of my bills, which the major sign that also now will call on DOT to do the study of the transportation desert. We also need to do better on the maintenance and repair of the train station. It should be the best experience for New Yorkers to say, if I get into the bus, I can get to my destination on time. So I believe that the congestion is a problem that we can address. It is important to get the public and the private sector together. I think that also now the proposal that we have presented by Move New York, this is something that we should entertain, that we should discuss and hear from everyone the pro and con. But I think that the solution of congestion in Midtown is the responsibility of all New Yorkers. And I think it's doable and I think that we can fix this problem. Eh, quiero decir de que para mí la transportación es un problema muy serio. Tenemos congestionamiento en la ciudad, lo podemos resolver. Y el alcalde Bill de Blasio con la comisionada de transportación y el jefe de tráfico de la policía, Chief Chan, están haciendo un trabajo. Yo espero que esto sea solamente un comienzo para buscar solución a un problema que afecta a toda la ciudad. With that, thank you, Commissioner. The professor that I, eh, we spoke, he had to leave. Uh, I will give you the testimony, but thank you for all the time that you dedicate and chief time in the whole thing. Thank you. Now I'm going to be calling the first panel. Bruce Challer, a former commissioner. We will hear from Bruce and his plan. He's, he's also addressed the some proposal before on the issue of congestion. And then we will call the second panel. Okay, let's wait two minutes. And uh, Bruce, so that commissioner is back with us. I would like for the commissioner to be here by the time that also you present your testimony. DOT Commissioner is not leaving for the media information. She's be back to listen to the testimony.
Let's see his procedure. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the City Council. I'm Bruce Schaller, principal of Schaller Consulting in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm also the former uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner of Traffic and Planning at New York City DOT, and have worked extensively on traffic, transit, taxi, and related issues in New York and nationally. I appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning. I'm here on my own behalf. And I'll focus on two key points that are related to traffic congestion in the Manhattan core. And I'm particularly pleased to respond to some of the needs expressed this morning for new and creative solutions to traffic congestion in this area. The first point is recent declines in Manhattan traffic speeds are primarily due to the growth in jobs, tourism, construction, and pedestrian and other activity. Vehicle entries would you mind to restart again? I wanted the commissioner to be here from the beginning. Is she back right now? Sure. Thanks. So good to have you. Hi. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the City Council. I'm Bruce Schaller, Principal of Schaller Consulting based in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm also the former uh, Deputy uh, 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 Commissioner of Traffic and Planning at New York City DOT. Um, I'll focus this morning on two key points related to traffic congestion in the Manhattan core, and I'm particularly pleased to, to have the opportunity to respond to some of the needs expressed this morning um, for new and creative solutions to the problem of traffic congestion in this area. The first point is recent declines in Manhattan traffic speeds are primarily due to the growth in jobs, tourism, construction, and pedestrian and other activity in the core of Manhattan, and Commissioner Trottenberg made this point earlier. Vehicle entries, in other words, traffic counts crossing both 60th Street and on the river crossings have been falling since the, la since the late 1990s. So to accommodate the growth in activity in Manhattan while avoiding gridlock, what the city needs, put very simply, and this was said by one of the council members earlier today, what the city needs is less traffic dramatically less traffic. One essential part of the solution here is clearly road pricing. Without pricing, Manhattan traffic will continue to just crawl along. Speeds on Midtown avenues have been stuck at about eight miles per hour for nearly 90 years, and there's studies from the 20s that show this. Only a congestion charge, such as Move New York, and that's one example, and there may be others, can dramatically reduce Manhattan traffic volumes and improve speeds. The second basic point I'd like to touch on is that the city needs to address the rapid growth in on-demand ride services such as Uber and Lyft. There are two sides to this growth. Clearly, these services have added valuable new options for getting around town, but they have also added 50,000 vehicles and 600 million miles of driving to city streets since 2013 as I showed in a report earlier this year. That translates to an increase of about 20% since 2013 in mileage driven in the Manhattan core by the for hire sector as a whole, including Uber, Lyft, yellow cabs, and black cars. So that's a significant increase to Manhattan traffic volumes. This proliferation of ride service vehicles can be seen as a problem, but I also think that it presents an opportunity the city can achieve the goal of less traffic by reducing the amount of time that taxis and ride service drivers spend cruising around empty or double parked while waiting for the next passenger or otherwise taking up some of the most valuable real estate in America. Reducing this unproductive and unnecessary time on Manhattan streets would benefit everybody. Taxi and for hire drivers would make more trips each shift, boosting their earnings. Everyone else would get to their destination faster and, and have less traffic to contend with. There would also be fewer crashes and cleaner air. The city should act to reduce unnecessary mileage and time the taxi and for hire drivers spend on Manhattan's congested streets. I've been looking at this issue and looking at potential solutions 
And as I have results from my analysis, I'd be very happy to share them with you. To conclude, less traffic would benefit all New Yorkers, whether they're in a motor vehicle or not. Reducing unnecessary driving, I think, is a good place to start. So I thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions. City should uh, put a cap in the number of city of four higher vehicle? No. Why? So I think the problem with a cap is twofold. One is I don't think it works because if you put a, if there were a cap on the number of four higher vehicles citywide, a lot of those drivers who are in the boroughs would come into Manhattan. So the result would be less service in eastern Queens, eastern Brooklyn areas that have poor transit service currently, and there'd be just as many vehicles in Manhattan. So we wouldn't be solving the problem, but we would be causing other problems, which is a lack of service that they've very helpfully brought um, throughout the city. Uh, the second reason is that I think there are other means that are more um, amenable to the goals we have here. And I think the place to start, and I think there's a number of different opportunities, I think the place to start is by identifying what is really unnecessary, which is what I've been calling unnecessary driving, unproductive driving without a passenger. So vehicles, cabs, and Ubers and the like are spending 10 or 12 minutes from dropping off one passenger to the time they pick up the next one. It doesn't need to be that amount of time. It could be less. And through some combination of fleet management and, and I think pricing, I think we can reduce that. I think that would be a useful place to start, both in terms of of addressing congestion issues in Manhattan, and also be sort of a starter place for dealing with pricing. We've all felt pretty stuck with proposals for congestion pricing, which I worked on very extensively a decade ago. Um, so if we can do some other creative pricing that's very fleet-based, fleet I think there's some opportunities there to do that, that there would be broad public consensus on, that we could get the necessary approvals. We might through the franchise power, have the, approve, have the power, the city might have the power to do that itself, I think, although we need some legal opinion on that. Um, and I think if we can show the effectiveness of, of fleet management and the effectiveness of pricing in a targeted way, we can then work from there as a building block and go forward with other fleets and other pricing mechanisms. Right. My second question is, do you think that the city should work with a truck company, so truck association, those representing that industry, and work to continue incentivizing for delivering to be made not during the rush hours? Yes, absolutely. And I worked on this program while I was at the DOT. It's a very promising program. There are benefits. They need incentives at the beginning because it's a big change. Over time, in the pilot, the companies, both the shippers and receivers, found that they benefited. It made business sense to do it. And so I'm very encouraged by DOT's program to expand this and work closely with the industry because um, it's, it, it's beneficial to the companies involved and it's obviously beneficial from a street and, and congestion standpoint. Bruce, and we will continue being in touch with you it, as I say, you know, that it is a responsibility of everyone, you know, from leaders in previous administration and the course administration to put the best talents in place so that we can take our transportation system to the best place in the next couple of decades. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioners. Yes. Next panel. Roderick Hills, Michael Simons, Harry Malakov, and Kendra Hems.
Thanks. We call your name. Alex, we call you. Nine and every other. Sorry for the delay. There was a little bit of a scrum out there, a little interest in what we have to say today. Uh, Chairman Rodriguez and honorable members of the New York City Council Transportation Committee, thank you for the honor of inviting me to speak to your committee today. I am president of Blue Marble Project. My name is Alex Matheson. I am president of the Blue Marble Project, an environmental consulting firm, as well as the director of the Move New York campaign and coalition, on whose behalf I am testifying today. Move New York is a region-wide grassroots campaign seeking to build support for a master transportation plan for the New York City metropolitan area, developed by traffic guru Gridlock Sam Schwartz and the Move New York Coalition. The coalition, comprised of business groups, unions, clergy, civic leaders, transportation and environmental advocates, and good governance organizations, formed in 2010 in response to the growing crisis facing the region's transportation system. Severe service cuts, escalating fares and tolls, potholed roads, roads, deteriorating bridges, and a dwindling funding base with which to fund the maintenance and improvement of our transit and road network. I think we can all agree that the crisis is even more acute today, which is, of course, why you, Chairman Rodriguez, call this important hearing, and we're very grateful to you for your leadership. I just do want to say as an aside, I live in uh, Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn, Normally, if I were to take a cab, it takes about 15, to, it should take about 15 to 20 minutes to get to City Hall. It took me 50, five zero minutes to do so today. And the only reason I took a cab, because I, I normally ride my bike or take public transit, is that my colleague uh, Rick Hills told me the F train was having a lot of trouble and it was not reliable. So it just, case in point of, of, the, of the trouble we face. Most of you are by now familiar with the Move New York Fair Plan, which was introduced last spring in a pair of similar bills in the New York State Assembly and Senate. In essence, the Move New York bills envision a toll swap, whereby tolls are restored on the four East River bridges, as well as along 60th Street, and reduced by nearly half on the MTA's seven bridges. The plan would, would place a surcharge on all four hire vehicles, which are otherwise exempt from the CBD tolls, within the taxi exclusion zone. The Albany plan would raise an estimated $1.5 billion a year, improve Manhattan traffic speeds by up to 18%, commit $350 million a year to New York City road and bridge maintenance, and generate, through bonding, $15 to $20 billion in capital funding to upgrade and expand the MTA transit system, including $4.5 billion that would be controlled by local officials to meet local transit needs. Unfortunately, for the time being, that plan has stalled in Albany. We got to the 10-yard line with goal to go, while we had nearly 30 co-sponsors on the Assembly Bill and a powerful bipartisan pair of senators on the Senate Bill, there were too many legislators who privately support the bills but couldn't justify signing on without leadership from the governor. Likewise, the governor, who has said the plan has merit, may not have seen enough explicit support in the legislature to justify expending the political capital needed to get the plan passed, the ultimate catch-22. However, there is another path. Move New York is here today to unveil a quote-unquote home rule version of its toll reform plan that the New York City Council can enact without approval from Albany. Based on extensive legal analysis conducted by NYU law school professor Roderick Hills, we are confident that the city has the full legal authority to toll its own roads and bridges. In a moment, Professor Hills will explain exactly how. The case he will make has been vetted and endorsed by five luminaries in New York City law, including former corporation counsel Fritz Schwartz. 
Before I turn the mic over to Professor Hills, allow me to outline the Home Rule version of the Move New York plan that we envision. Let me say up front that it will not solve the city's subway crisis nor the MTA's funding shortfall. Only the governor and the state legislature are in a position to do that. But the Home Rule plan, as we've dubbed it, could be a boon to New Yorkers. Here's how it works. Like the state version of the Move New York plan, an electronic charge would be imposed on drivers using any of the four East River bridges or crossing 60th Street in each direction. Four hire vehicles are exempt from the CBD tolls. Instead, they pay a congestion surcharge based on travel time and distance within the Manhattan Taxi Exclusion Zone, which, as you guys know, is south of 110th Street on the west side and 96th Street on the east side. Unlike the state plan, the toll would only be $2.75, less than half the amount under the original plan. The surcharge, which has been endorsed by, uh, I'm back to the taxi, sorry. The surcharge, which has been endorsed by Uber, the Metro Taxi Board of Trade, Black Car Fund, and others who support Move New York's toll reform efforts, is designed to keep for hire vehicles from flooding Midtown and downtown and also ensure that the largest share of total revenue raised is paid by Manhattan residents. Prior congestion pricing initiatives, such as the Bloomberg plan that died in the state legislature in 2008, required residents of Queens and Brooklyn to shoulder the greatest burden. After expenses, the Home Rule congestion pricing plan generates over $1 billion annually which the city can use to better maintain the East River bridges and city-owned roads, work with the MTA to expand the city's bus system, and pay the, for the fair share, sorry, the fair fare proposal to discount cost, the cost of Metro cards for low-income households. Under our plan, legislation implementing the plan would include a lockbox provision to ensure that 100 percent of the revenues are spent on transportation infrastructure and transit improvements. At the risk of stating the obvious, let me say one thing about the amount of the new CBD fee. It's no coincidence that our $2.75 charge is the same as the fare New Yorkers pay to ride the subway or bus. I would challenge any driver to come up with a credible argument as to why it's not fair for him or her to pay $2.75 to drive a car into the most congested part of the city when everyone else in the city and region, and I mean everyone, save pedestrians and bicyclists, is paying that amount or more to make the same trip. This is especially true when you consider the relative impacts of a vehicle trip, with its attendant carbon emissions, wear and tear on taxpayer-funded taxpayer roads, and danger of collisions, as compared to a strap hanger occupying a few square feet of space on a good day on a New York subway. I'm sorry he's not here, but we've temporarily uh, uh, named this the Danique Miller Plan, because I don't think that even Councilman Miller uh, could argue against the logic and fairness of a subway priced toll. To be clear, the Move New York Coalition would much prefer that Albany implement our original version of the plan, which would price the new tolls at $5.76 each way and cut tolls by an average of over 40 percent on all seven MTA bridges. The $1.5 billion raised annually would not only maintain the East River bridges and other roadways, but also finance a $15 to $20 billion investment in the MTA's faltering subway system. But if Governor Cuomo and the state legislature are not prepared to get behind the Move New York proposal, the city should take the lead in adopting a common sense alternative that will go a long way towards fixing our roads and bridges, reducing traffic, and improving our bus network, and reap the rewards of being able to control the revenue and improve the lives of New Yorkers. To borrow a phrase, New York is burning. New Yorkers are suffering and increasingly late to work, appointments, or opportunities to patronize the city's businesses. They're increasingly stuck on slow buses impeded by traffic or on crowded, unreliable subways or idling in their cars. We need leadership, and we believe that the body most equipped to provide it, and I mean this quite sincerely, is the New York City Council. I will just say as an aside that in the last 24 hours since the Wall Street Journal reported on this new plan and the city's authority to toll its own roads and bridges, I have had many conversations and texts with many of your colleagues, and I've gotten uh, a, a very impressive number of very enthusiastic responses, including some that I would characterize as ecstatic. Uh, so I think there's potentially a lot of enthusiasm uh, uh, for this idea. So the Move New York Coalition looks forward to rolling up our sleeves to help you get it done. I appreciate the opportunity to share our view and would welcome any questions you might have. And I do hope that uh, my colleague, Professor 
uh, Rick Hills has a chance to testify as well because he's the one that really has the crux of the information you need, which is that, uh, in fact, the, the City Council, the City of New York, does, in fact, have the authority to toll its own roads and bridges. And I would just say as a kind of prelude to that, um, that as much as I uh, respect and appreciate Commissioner Trottenberg, who's done terrific things for the city and is a great transportation commissioner, I think she's relying a little bit on conventional wisdom, which we all have, and we all have, have uh, been guilty of, which is the general feeling that the city's looked in this at this issue and has uh, concluded that the city does not have the authority. I think Professor Hills will make a pretty compelling case that that's in fact not the case, that the issue has not been looked at extensively. We finally have, and we are very confident in our finding that the city does indeed have that authority. Thank you very much. My name is Harry so, Mala. I'm sorry, Alice, if you don't mind. Is that Professor here? Oh, yeah. So do you want to get the professor and then we can? Yeah, do you get it? Can I another chair? If, if you move a little bit, another one chair there. Scoot over here. Okay. I don't want to take any chair. Okay, this is good. Okay. Where's room at the table? Th thank you, Chairman Rodriguez, and um, for um, allowing me to offer an opinion regarding the statutory power of New York City. Sorry, and for the time, I'm going to be giving like a three minutes, so if you can summarize, and then you we'll get into detail on another question. Uh, so my name is Roderick Hills. I teach at NYU Law School. I teach, among other things, local government law with a focus on New York City. Um, for years, I've taught a class as Peter the Zimroth, former corporation counsel on New York City law. Um, and in the course of that class, um, we've studied the question of whether New York City has the power, independently under the vehicle and transportation law, to toll its roads and bridges. As a written submission, I've provided to the Commission a memo explaining in greater detail my reasons for believing that New York City indeed does have the power to toll its bridges and roads without further state legislation. As indicated by the cover letter, it has been endorsed by Fritz Schwartz, a former corporation counsel, Eric Lane, who served as both executive director and counsel to the historic New York City Charter Revision of 1989, Richard Brafalt, professor at Columbia Law School and currently chair of the Conflicts of Interest Board, and a regular consultant with the New York City um, on its home rule and statutory powers. Now, I'm not here to express any opinion about the wisdom, policy merits of congestion fees, only to give you an illegal opinion. But before I do that, and in fact, in lieu of that, I just have to say a word about Commissioner Trottenberg's testimony. She says something that has been repeated to me repeatedly by law department lawyers and by agency lawyers, many of whom are close friends of mine. Indeed, one of them is a colleague who's my co-author, co Vicki Bean. That they, say, they will say this, legal experts have repeatedly studied this issue and have expressed the, the opinion that the city lacks the power to impose fees or tolls. Now, let me set the record straight on that. The public record is completely devoid of any serious legal analysis or even an official corporation council opinion on the scope of the city's power under the vehicle and traffic law to toll bridges and roads. The last opinion on this subject that we know about dates from January 16th, 1959, 60 years ago. And contrary to what Commissioner Trottenberg says, as far as we can tell, that corporation council opinion says the city does have power without further state legislation to impose tolls pursuant to section 1642A4. So it's strange to me to hear the city repeatedly say we've studied this and we don't have the power. Now, on top of that, keep in mind that in the 1970s under Abe Beam administration, Mayor Beam sought state legislation to outlaw East River tolls. What sense does that make if the city never had the power in the first place? The Lindsay administration and the Koch administration also took the position that they could toll the East River bridges without further state legislation. So next time a city lawyer tells you, we've studied the issue, we don't have the power, ask them for an official opinion. You have the power to ask the Corporation Council for an official opinion. You can even get them to waive the privileges on whatever opinions they currently have. Or failing that, why not ask Kathy on your own general counsel, for an opinion about the city's power? I've talked to Liz Fine, Jeff Metzler is a friend of mine. None of them, I think, will readily accede to the opinion that you've been given. Uh, good afternoon, my name's Harry Malakoff. I'm a private citizen who's had an interest in this subject for many years. 
According to a recent report in Crane's New York business, an estimated 25% of New York City car drivers improperly register their vehicles out of state. The main reason given that people do this is due to our very high auto insurance costs. According to insure.com, the average car insurance in New York City is about $2,800 a year, compared to $900 nationwide, or almost $2,000 more here in the city. If we take the New York State DMV figure of 1.9 million cars registered in the city and use Crane's estimate of 25% more due to improper registration, we actually have just under half a million additional illegally added cars. Many of these nearly half million vehicle owners would be highly motivated to give up their cars if their insurance costs were to increase by $2,000 a year. If even only 10% of such owners were to change to using mass transit, there'd be 50,000 fewer cars on our streets. You might ask, how do we do this? One easy way is to enforce proper registration would be to enact resident-only parking in the city. Many other U.S. cities have such rules, including Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, Dallas, Chicago, San Francisco, and many others. I believe we would need state-enabling legislation to implement resident-only rules, but based on the environmental good that it would bring, it's an, a no-brainer. There's another major additional benefit to enacting this change. According to Cranes, there would be revenue enhancement of $100 million per year to the city and state. The New Yorkers who practice this improper registration cheat the city and state of much needed revenue each and every year. The money would come to us without enacting uh, any new tax or user base. Newly collected sales taxes, auto use fees, registration charges, and parking ticket fines would make up this total. In 1991, the New York Times reported that Mayor Dinkin, Dinkins invited city residents to City Hall to make suggestions to improve the city. Fully 10% of the ideas submitted to the DOT that day urged the city to impose resident-only parking. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, now summarized, okay. 30 seconds. Uh, enactment of resident-only parking will result in a reduction of car ownership by city residents. The city and state would collect, according to Cranes, about $100 million more per year, and many New Yorkers, including the New York Times in an editorial, have advocated for such rules. Right. The, the council should push hard for the city and state to enact this legislation. We would have another $100 million in our pockets and reduce the number of cars. Right. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kendra Hems. I am the president of the Trucking Association of New York. I'd like to thank Chairman Rodriguez for the invitation to be here today. We are a nonprofit, member driven organization that represents the trucking industry in New York. We strive to enhance the operating and business environment of the industry. And one of our primary missions is to improve safety within the industry and among all users of our roads and highways. You have a copy of my full testimony. Rather than reading that, I'd like to just highlight a couple of key points. Um, <clears throat> recently, there was a survey by the American Transportation Re uh, Research Institute that calculated annual congestion costs just to the trucking industry to be over $63 billion nationwide. In this region, which ranks the worst um, as far as cost, it is $4.6 billion annually in total congestion costs to the trucking industry. And as unfortunately we know, congestion in the region is only getting worse. Between 2014 and 2015, we saw a 13.2% increase in congestion in the area. As an industry, we are well aware that commercial vehicles are often looked at as one of the primary causes, culprits causing congestion. It should be noted, however, that based on multiple studies from various sources, commercial vehicles actually account for less than 10% of all traffic in the city. As it relates to environmental impacts from congestion, the trucking industry continues to improve energy and environmental efficiency, even while increasing the number of drive, uh, miles driven. Through advancements in engine technology and fuel refinements, new diesel truck engines produce 98% fewer emissions than similar engines manufactured prior to 1990. In fact, in newer diesel engines, the air exiting the exhaust is actually cleaner than the air it takes in. Currently, 91% of all goods transported into and out of New York City are carried by truck. 
and through 2040, projections show freight tonnage in the region to grow by 46%. While theories such as freight tunnels or freight ferries sound attractive to reduce the number of trucks, in reality, only those trucks that bypass the city's central core would use this option, and the resulting traffic may adversely affect Mespeth or South Brooklyn. By and large, trucks will continue to be the dominant mode of freight delivery well into the future. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. My name is Mike Seamus. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Partnership for New York City. Uh, we represent the city's business leaders and largest private sector employers and work to promote economic growth here in New York. In 2006, the Partnership commissioned a study that estimated the annual cost of traffic congestion at $13 billion. Uh, over the last decade, conditions have gotten worse, which we've heard about here today. Uh, we'd estimate it would be over $20 billion if you did the same study today. Ultimately, congestion threatens the city's competitiveness and economic growth. Companies have been willing to pay high costs to be in the city because of ready access to a productive workforce as well as clients, customers, business relationships, and amenities. If access to these assets becomes less predictable, the value proposition declines. Uh, traffic problems are more complicated today than they were a decade ago. Online shopping, on-demand delivery, uh, increase of app-based ride companies are all growing. So how can New York more effectively address, address congestion? In 2007, we supported a congestion pricing plan that would have imposed a charge on all private vehicles entering Manhattan below 60th Street. We also support increasing the price of on-street parking and reducing the use of parking permits issued by government agencies. It should be understood, however, that these are not necessarily going to be a source of significant net revenues, since the primary objective is to reduce, reduce traffic and its costs, not to enhance revenues. At the same time, the city needs to implement new policies to manage freight and other commercial traffic, such as tourist buses. The city should also work with businesses to help increase the percentage of deliveries that occur outside of peak hours. There are some creative entrepreneurial companies, like Homer Logistics, that are providing deliveries by bicycle rather than vehicle. We should encourage that type of activity. Finally, convincing people to switch from vehicles to public transit requires a major effort to improve the public transportation experience. The governor recently announced his commitment to do whatever it takes to reduce delays and service interruptions and improve conditions within the MTA system. This is a good start, but it's going to require public and private interests in the city, the region, and the state legislature to get behind the effort. It's also important that city initiatives like the ferries uh, provide intermodal transfers and, and are easier to use. These are a few of the highlights, but we would recommend and offer to help convene and fund a formal effort to review these issues and mobilize support for actions to reduce congestion in all of these areas. Uh, we hope you'll agree that this is something that we can, as a city, undertake in partnership with the MTA and other interested parties. Thank you. With that, uh, what I can say is that with the Plan of New York, we will be reading your proposal. And as I said before, like, uh, we should welcome all suggestions on how we can address congestion in New York City. Okay? With that, we can call in out the next panel. Stefano Trevison from Rethink Studio, Alex Latke from AAA Northeast, uh, Eric McClure from Streets Pack, uh, David, uh, I can't remember, mm, Polkak, yeah, Pollock, Pollock, there you go, uh, and Adriana Espinosa. You may begin. You can go. Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric McClure. I'm executive director of Streets Pack. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues, thanks for the opportunity to weigh in on today on the increasingly vexing problem of congestion in New York City. Uh, the elephant in the room, of course, is congestion pricing, which would be undoubtedly the most effective means of relieving congestion and discouraging car trips to Manhattan, as we heard uh, many times already today. 
um, it's high time for the state legislature to grant New York City the right to pass a congestion pricing plan. Um, and if uh, Alex and Professor Hills are correct, even better if New York City has that authority and will exercise it itself. Notwithstanding Albany's inaction, there are a number of measures New York City can enact on its own uh, apart from a congestion pricing plan to deal with congestion. We've borrowed four of these verbatim from an article that David Meyer published on Streets Blog on February 15th, entitled Four Ways the Mayor Can Reduce Congestion Without Congestion Pricing, since we couldn't say it any better or more plainly than David did. Um, it's detailed in our written testimony. I'll just highlight some points. Um, number one is to charge smarter prices for curbside parking. Underpricing of curbside parking fuels uh, unwarranted demand for driving and, and free parking. The city also needs to revive and greatly expand the ParkSmart program, which has been proven successful in open, uh, opening up parking spaces uh, and reducing cruising for parking spots. And the launch of the Park NYC app um, should serve as a first step to uh, de developing a dynamic pricing system for pricing curbside parking. Second point is on parking placard reform. Um, as Councilmember Lander mentioned earlier, the, the recent decision to grant 50,000 parking placards to the Department of Education is exactly the opposite of what we need to be doing in, in dealing with uh, parking placards. Um, we need much, much better enforcement of the placards that have been issued already and uh, need to reduce that number rather than grow it. The city can also implement HOV restrictions on East River bridges. While rush hour HOV restrictions are a blunt instrument compared to toll reform, the impact could still be significant, reducing the amount of cars coming into Midtown and Lower Manhattan at times when the street grid needs the most relief. Um, this is something that should be strongly considered during the L train shutdown over the coming years. Um, point number four is to prioritize bus service on city streets. DOT has identified street segments where buses need priority and the agency is in the process of generating a citywide plan to speed buses up. It won't cure congestion, but strong follow through on this initiative from the mayor will help New York City's car-free majority bypass traffic bottlenecks. In addition to these four critical areas, there are at least two more policy areas worth examining. The first is getting a handle on app-based ride hailing services like Uber and Lyft. One only needs to look at the number of GMC Suburbans with TLC plates plying the streets of Manhattan, often carrying just a single passenger, to know that these vehicles are a major contributor to increased congestion. But we have more than anecdote. Thanks again to Bruce Schaller, who in February released his report on the effective growth of app-based ride services on city streets. We have data. Mr. Mr. Schaller's report shows that ride service trips have boomed since June 2015 and added 600 million miles of driving to city streets in 2016. It's time for the City Hall to revisit uh, a means of reining in these ride, the, these miles driven, and if City Hall won't act, the City Council must take the lead in crafting a solution. Lastly, better management of truck deliveries on city streets could also help address the congestion problem. As the growth of deliveries by UPS and FedEx and Fresh Direct and others grow unabated, we need to take a hard look at our freight system. So we support Council Member Levine's Intro 1031, which would require DOT to study the effect of truck deliveries on congestion. It's a good first step that will likely lead us toward requiring off-hour deliveries in the city's most congested areas, more dedicated loading zones, and smaller, smarter, more nimble vehicles for the last mile. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Alex Slatke. I'm here testifying on behalf of AAA Northeast, which serves a membership of over 570,000 drivers in the five boroughs. I want to thank uh, the committee for holding this hearing. And you know, congestion is a problem, obviously, obviously that's endemic to New York City. It's not one that we want to see eradicated entirely, as we talked about a lot of uh, the congestion as the, as the result of, of growth, which is great for the city and reflects a booming economy and a lot of the major infrastructure projects which can help prevent congestion from getting worse, like Gateway, Port Authority Bus Terminal, a Cross Harbor Freight Tunnel are outside the city's purview. Uh, but there are some things that I want to mention uh, that haven't been mentioned, so I won't go through the whole testimony. Um, a couple things about maybe taking a fresh look at some alternate side parking restrictions, which uh, if there are multiple days where there's alternate side parking, that could be incentive for someone to, to drive rather than leave the car there uh, and take mass transit for that day. Uh, evaluating the addition of dedicated turning lanes at congested, congested intersections. And one thing I wanted to highlight, 
uh, I think in September 2015, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer convened a forum about congestion, and there we called for increased enforcement of blocking the box, and the city's delivered that. Um, in calendar year 2016, drivers received over 31,000 tickets for blocking the box, which is more than double what they received in 2015, and that's, that's good news. Um, but one thing we want to highlight is to enhance the deterrent effect of parking tickets and parking tickets like for double parking, which are also uh, obviously related to congestion. We have to take a look with the DMV and with DOT at the most egregious and frequent violators because I listed here, there are 63 cars with, with at least 50 violations of violation code 47, it's double parking in Midtown. 97 cars with at least 50 violations of violation code 46, that's double parking outside of Midtown. Zero were registered in New York. Most of them were registered in New Jersey. And just one example, so someone who has 195 tickets in calendar year 2016 for double parking outside Midtown registered in New Jersey. So we have to check to make sure they're paying that. And then that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for always being here. Good afternoon. My name is Adriana Espinosa. I'm the manager of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. I would like to thank Chairman uh, Rodriguez for the opportunity to testify today. From one of New York City's plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 20, uh, 80% by 2050 to last Friday's executive order, reaffirming our commitment to the Paris Accord, this uh, Mayor de Blasio and his administration has demonstrated significant environmental leadership. Making good on these commitments, however, requires aggressive action in all sectors of city life, including transportation. In 2014, our city's transportation sector was responsible for 28% of the city's overall greenhouse gas emissions, and these emissions were overwhelmingly from private vehicles at 91.6%. The city's roadmap to 80 by 50 identifies strategies to achieve our 80 by 50 goal in transportation that would not only reduce our carbon footprint, but also have a huge impact on traffic congestion. Reducing congestion on our streets means providing a range of fast, affordable, frequent, and convenient low-carbon alternatives to riders. Approximately half of the workers who live in the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island work in their own borough. Yet fewer than half of these commutes are made by transit because driving across town is often easier, faster, and more appealing than riding the bus or taking the train if those options even exist. This, is, this has an enormous impact on traffic congestion and emissions. Serious investments in our region's subways, commuter rails, buses, and bicycle networks combined with limits on the construction of new off-street parking can help shift trips to more environmentally friendly modes of transportation, thus reducing congestion. This work requires integrating new technologies and smarter strategies into our public infrastructure, like upgrades to the bus system, encouraging cycling, uh, for example, with the rise of inexpensive rideshare services to fill in gaps in the transit network, our bike network must become an enticing alternative if we are to reduce congestion. The city must continue to work with Motivate to help to expand and improve city bike while making matching improvements to bike infrastructure. Outer borough rail service, access to passenger rail service along the underused freight rail line between Bay Ridge and Jackson Heights, nominally known as the Tri-Borough, deserves additional study and serious consideration and reconsidering road pricing. This often polarizing topic must be considered as a means of shifting automobile trips from to transit and developing a mechanism to better fund increased ridership, ridership on our transit network. Strategies such as pricing on for hire vehicles in congested areas, congestion fees in the central business district, or reforming, reforming tolls similar to the Move New York plan that we heard here today must be an essential part of the congestion. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is David Pollock. I'm the president of the Taxi Cab Service Association. I'm also known as Taxi Dave. I have a radio show and a newspaper. And my testimony today is actually my editorial called Congestion Kills People and Businesses. Um, I'll read that and then I have a couple of other comments. Just when you thought traffic couldn't get any worse in New York City, the TLC announced they expect an additional 35,000 FHVs to be licensed in uh, 2017. I met an old timer last week, and uh, he told, the, and I've known him for 40 years, and he says that traffic has never been worse than it is today. And I've been driving in Manhattan a lot recently myself, and I have to state traffic has never been worse in Manhattan. 
Uh, add an additional 100,000 vehicles registered in New York City over the past five years, most of them FHVs, and the formula for total gridlock is approaching. There was once a time not too long ago when an emergency vehicle with their sirens could move swiftly even during rush hour in Manhattan because there was enough street space for other vehicles to move and yield. Today, congestion is the norm with 30% less street space caused by dedicated bike lanes. Yes, bike lanes are not a cornucopia. They are an accessory to congestion, a culprit of sorts, if you will. Additionally, pedestrian areas that used to be driving streets, such as Times Square or 33rd Street between 7th and 8th Avenues, result in and are the cause of an acceptable waiting time for traffic flow at every traffic signal for surrounding areas and obviously the additional cause of congestion. In the recent past, delivery trucks could pull alongside the curb to deliver goods to restaurants, food stores, clothing shops, etc. Locksmiths used to park curbside to help those locked out, and deliveries of flowers by truck were common. A friend of mine got rid of five of his six delivery trucks because the cost of parking tickets outweighed the cost of the flowers delivered. Now he only delivers to hospitals and locations outside of Manhattan, uh, even though his shop is in Midtown Manhattan. He also told me he sends two men in the truck so one of them can move the truck instead of getting a parking summons. Parking ticket income is back to close to a billion dollars in New York City, and you pay for those parking summonses. Higher expenses for those delivery food tra translates into higher food prices, higher restaurant prices. And now you know why everything in Manhattan costs so much, such as flowers and your local locksmith. Congestion kills business. Take taxis. Uh, statistics show drivers of yellow taxis picked up 20% fewer fares than just a couple of years ago and earned 15% less. This means the perception of not being able to get a yellow cab is being enhanced by congestion. While tourism and residency grows, the ability to service this growing Manhattan population is diminishing due to congestion. Now, Vision Zero, we all love Vision Zero. It's about saving lives. And why the heck isn't someone doing something constructive about traffic congestion in Manhattan so emergency vehicles like ambulances can get to the injured and the sick to a hospital? Um, I'm, I'm just going to sum up and say that congestion does kill. I wanted to make a couple of comments about uh, we've been, yellow cabs have been cruising for 100 years. It was never a problem, and now there are 100,000 vehicles licensed by the Taxi and Limousine Commission, only 13,000 of those are yellow cabs. Um, a cap, the cap Bruce Schaller said he wouldn't be in favor of, the cap should be for app-based companies, app-based FHVs. Not all FHVs, the app-based FHVs. And LaGuardia traffic was a mess. You read the stories about seniors walking across the Grand Central Parkway to catch their planes. Bruce Schaller, uh, Bruce Schaller, uh, Gridlock Sam came in and he had a designated waiting area, okay, at LaGuardia, and that solved the traffic problem. We don't need four higher vehicles cruising in Manhattan. We need yellow right. cabs. Thank you for your time. Right. Thank you. Oh, you're speaking. Just one comment. Arthur Goldstein, uh, the counsel to the TSA. Um, at the last budget hearing, uh, after the commissioner of TLC testified about uh, one of the items testified was the $35,000 figure that uh, David Pollock just uh, referenced, 35,000 vehicles. Uh, <clears throat> and the Chairman Rodriguez commented uh, and kind of opened the door to this conversation about a cap. Um, we strongly encourage you to continue that, that dialogue on, on a cap because the rest of her testimony referenced a continued growth in the number of, of vehicles beyond the 35,000. Uh, we, we said it a couple of years ago when it was 20,000 vehicles. Uh, we're, we're now tens of thousands of vehicles past that. It's, it's time to reconsider the cap, as, as you mentioned at the last budget hearing. Thank you. And with these panels, we finish this hearing today, and I think that everyone making important contributions to this discussion. Thank you.